Good morning and welcome to our March 24th, 2022 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today, and to those who are watching us on live stream via the MCPS website and MCPS TV. Now let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll now call the roll to recognize board members and establish that we have a quorum, starting with Ms. O'Looney. Good afternoon. So nice to see so many people here. Ms. Harris. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon. Dr. Daka. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Evans. Good afternoon. And Dr. Joftis. Good afternoon. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, President Wolf, and good afternoon, board members and all who are joining us. I do bring forward uh, three appointments today. And the first appointment is Mrs. Stephanie Wallace. Recommended appointment for a supervisor for social workers in the Office of Student and Family Support and Engagement. Mrs. Wallace brings more than 24 years of experience as crisis intervention specialist, program therapist, special education transition specialist, and most recently as school social worker. Mrs. Wallace looks forward to joining Montgomery County Public Schools to support the social and emotional well-being of all students. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Our next appointment is Dr. Mary Jane Ennis as principal of Georgian Forest Elementary School. Dr. Ennis has been employed with MCPS for seven years as a principal, director, and most recently as acting principal at Georgian Forest Elementary School. Dr. Ennis looks forward to continuing to support the Georgian Forest Elementary School community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. And our final appointment today would be a recommended appointment for Mrs. Catherine West as principal of Barriard Ruston Elementary School. Mrs. West has been employed with MCPS for 15 years as a teacher, reading specialist, assistant principal, and most recently as acting principal at Bayard Rustin Elementary School. Mrs. West looks forward to upholding the tradition of excellence and while supporting the academic, social, and emotional well-being of the Bayard Rustin Elementary School community. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. <laughs> okay, we're now up to recognitions, Dr. McKnight. Thank you, President Wolf, and congratulations to all who have been appointed. Um, for our recognitions today, we have uh, several, and our first is recogni recognizing Arab American Heritage Month. Whereas more than a century, Arab Americans have shared their rich culture and traditions and have made valuable contributions to all aspects of American society, including medicine, law, business, education, technology, government, sports, the arts, and numerous other distinctive professions. Arab American Heritage Month is a nationwide celebration of honors, achievements, and contributions of Arab Americans. Individuals of Arab and Middle Eastern descent are ethnically, religiously, and politically diverse. MCPS is committed to inclusive curricula, creating welcoming environments and learning experiences for Arab American students, and provides professional learning opportunities for teachers through longstanding partnerships the Georgetown University Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and the Alawid Ben Talad Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. <coughs> Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of April 2022 to be Arab Heritage 
American Heritage Month and encouraged staff, students, parents, guardians, and the community to actively honor the courage and contributions of Arab Americans in Montgomery County, the state, and the nation, and enhance awareness of the impact of attitudes and expectations on the achievement of Arab American students. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Our next recognition is National Autism Awareness Month. April has been designated as National Autism Awareness Month by the Autism Society of America and Autism Speaks. Autism spectrum disorder refers to a range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communication. Approximately one in 44 children in the United States are diagnosed with autism across all cultural, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Montgomery County Public Schools serve students with autism ages birth to 21 in a range of settings promoting equitable access to services within the least restrictive environment. MCPS partners with family schools and community in the interest of ensuring that people with autism are accepted as valued members of Montgomery County. And a well-informed community will be knowledgeable about the strengths of people with autism. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of April 2022 to be National Autism Awareness Month and continue to pledge their support to the staff, members, families, and community partners who collectively work alongside one another to enhance the lives of all students with autism. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And our final recognition is recognition of celebrating the Arts Week. National Arts Education Organizations collaborated on the writing of the Arts Education is an essential statement that it is imperative that all students have access to an equitable delivery of arts education that includes dance, media arts, music, theater, and visual arts that support their social and emotional well-being. The Council for Arts Education administers Youth Art Month at the national level, which emphasizes the value of visual arts education for all children, encourages support for quality school art programs, and promotes art material safety. Youth Art Month also provides a forum for recognizing skills developed through visual arts experiences that are not possible in other curriculum subjects. The National Association for Music Education identifies March for the observance of Music in Our Schools Month, the time of year when music education becomes the focus of schools across the nation. Music education shapes the way all of our students understand themselves and the world around them, allowing for a deep engagement with learning. The American Alliance for Theater and Education and Educational Theater Association identify March as theater in our schools to celebrate theater <coughs> in our schools and in our schools in our theaters. The goals of theater in our schools are to raise public awareness of the impact of theater education and draw attention to the need for more access and opportunities to quality programs in and out of our school for all students. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Interim Superintendent of Schools hereby declare March 24th through the 31st, 2022 to be observed as celebrating the Arts Week to support arts education, the social emotional well-being of students, nurturing the creation of a welcoming school environment which creates a well-rounded education for all students. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. We now come to item five. Next is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings 
hearings and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 19 people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the exhaust ex expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have one video presentation. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. At this time, I'm going to ask Samara Hussein, Evelyn Chung, and Zakia Jabbar to come to the table. Go ahead, Ms. Hussein. Good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is Samira Hussein. I would like to greet you with a greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I am a mother of four graduates from MCPS, and I'm also a staff member of current MCPS with early childhood for 22 years. As a proud founder of the Arab American Heritage Month in 1998, I would like to thank Superintendent Dr. Monifa McKnight and the board president, Ms. Brenda Wolf, and all the board members and the executive staff for recognizing and acknowledging uh, Arab American Heritage Month this year. I just would like to note it's not written in the calendar, so please remind your staff and to, to do that. Given the news today, we all know there is a still work to do. There are threats to the long-fought efforts that many people in this room have done to make MCPS one of the best school systems, not for some, but for all of our children. Education is the key. We need to ensure that teachers, staff, and administrators are all are involved and educated about our children's education and well informed about their students' background and rights. We need to continue to ensure that students' self-confidence is not eroded with Islamophobia and Arab bigotry and to feel safe and supported in our schools. We can start by adding the words Ahlan wa Sahlan, which means welcome in Arabic to the many language posters that already exist in our facilities. A famous Arab American poet, Khalil Gibran, also the author of the best-selling book, The Prophet, said, it takes two to discover the truth, one to utter it and one to understand it. The contributions of Arab Americans are many, and I am yet to see one facility or a school named after an Arab American. And I'd like to add. Thank you, Ms. Hussein. We have you your have testimony. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Ms. Chung. Good afternoon, uh, Board of Education. My name is Evelyn Chung, and I represent the MCCPTA Gifted Education Committee. Two weeks ago, we submitted a letter asking this board to take a vote today to require MCPS to publish specific information on the public website by August 29th, 2022. In the past few years, we have heard from many parents who have asked for more transparency over the gifted programs. MCPS often requires parents and the Gifted Education Committee to submit Maryland Public Information Act requests for information that should be publicly available. Parents who file MPIAs are asked to pay hundreds of do dollars in fees, and even when they do, they do not receive all of the information they are seeking. The filers often do not have the means to hire a lawyer to press their case, and thus MCPS is allowed to hide behind unenforceable privacy objections. 
citizens. This lack of transparency and communication raises an even greater concern. For the most part, OSIP and OSSI do not create or require minimum standards for advanced curricula across schools. The result of this lack of oversight is inequitable, inconsistent programs across our schools and even our magnet programs. In short, MCPS is failing to meet its obligations under this board's policies and Marilyn Comar to provide gifted students with enrichment and acceleration. MCPS then minimizes the impact of these failures by concealing data on how many gifted students have been identified in each school. Therefore, we are asking MCPS to publish on their website data on how many gifted students are identified by school and demographic group and curriculum information and standards. While making information available is a first step towards transparency, real access to information must go beyond this step. MCPS must commit to best practices to make such informa information easily available and must actively work to remove barriers to accessing it. Without real access to information and both accountability and the trust it generates, there can be no academic excellence or equity. We appreciate the board's attention to these issues. Thank you, Ms. Jabbar. Greetings and thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Zakia Sankara Jabbar and I'm a parent of two children in MCPS. One is in ninth grade, that's my son, and one is in second grade, and that's my daughter. I'm here today uh, with really a number of questions uh, and concerns. Um, number one, I'm concerned about the security guards that are being added uh, to the elementary schools. Um, we've been in this district now for several years. One of the reasons why I chose this district is because there, at the time there was not a militarization of the elementary schools. There were no uniforms. There were no uh, police uh, in the elementary schools or security or anything like that. So I'm concerned about the security. I'm also concerned that this board's um, and the superintendent, I believe, have not uh, addressed the racial disparities uh, adequately, specifically when it comes to school discipline. I believe security guards are part of the discipline team. And I haven't heard through the strategic planning, I haven't heard anything about how this board and the superintendent plans to address racial disparities, particularly for black students and particularly for black male students. That's something I'm very, very concerned about. Then you're adding the police uh, back into the schools, which is so obviously concerning, and lots of people have been speaking out against that. I'm one of them. Um, and I would like to ask that you all please, again, reconsider that. Uh, the police being added to the schools uh, when you already have an issue where you all, your staff, meaning teachers, principals, assistant principals, are already disproportionately targeting black students for school discipline issues. So I'm wondering, if there is a plan of action, number one, to address school discipline and how it impacts black students, and then number two, have you shared that plan? I watched the strategic planning committee uh, last week. I didn't hear anything of it. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call Himanshu Jadaya, Grace Simonson, and Jimmy Perdomo to the table. Good afternoon. My name is Manchu Gadia, and I'm a student at Maguru High School. Unlike many times in the past, today I do not stand alone. I stand with the voice of the students that have not been heard. I stand with the leaders at Maguru that are fighting for the resources our students need. Today we have nine students from Maguru testifying. We stand here united and to uplift the voice of Maguru. There's no doubt that the shooting at Maguru has changed us. Us as a county, not just Maguru. This entire school year has changed us. This year we have seen a massive uptick in violent incidents around the county. There have been several serious incidents in MCPS this year where our own peers have seen death and fatal injuries. Schools like Northwest, Blair, BCC, Magruder, and more. As a result, our students are left in the dark with little to no support after seeing these, uh, these events unfold right before their eyes. 
We can provide mental health resources to our students, but there's no use if they're not accessible to the students that desperately need them. As we move forward with the plans to install 50 new social workers in Montgomery County, we, we ask that our students are put first. We ask that our well-being isn't jeopardized by so psychologists that are split between schools. We need mental health resources to be made accessible to every student, including the most overlooked ESOL students and students with disabilities. There has been a lack of implementation with the sheer amount of funding our county has for full-time psychologists, social workers, student well-being teams, telehealth, mindfulness spaces, and the resources our students need. It has been over two months since the incident in Magruder. We have not seen much change from what we already had before the incident, which, which leaves me with the question I fear the most. What is stopping another shooting, another homicide, another suicide from happening again in MCPS? If student voice matters, if other voice matters, then why have I only seen the bare minimum? We don't need empty promises. We saw what the lack of these resources has resulted in, not just at Magruder, but around the county. We need an investment in our mental health and an end to these temporary solutions. I'm truly proud of all the Magruder student leaders here today. It is about time our voices are heard. Today we speak on the behalf of Magruder, underrepresented schools, and students from around the county. Today we unite. Ms. Simonson, go ahead. Good afternoon, my name is Grace Simonson and I'm a senior and a heavily involved student leader at Magruder High School. After what happened at our school on January 21st, we were given a half day to talk with our sixth period class. A counselors from all over the county were provided to get us to talk about what happened. We learned we had a school psychologist because one was made available. And each day in the week following, we were given a therapy dog and there's been one every Friday since. Whether the resources helped the students or not, they were made accessible. Everyone in this county was able to acknowledge that these students at this high school were in need of mental health resources. So I'm asking, does it require a student to get shot in order for, men for students to be given access to mental health resources? Does it require a student at Blair High School to be stabbed in order for students to be heard when they say their schools feed into their anxieties? Of 50 school social workers promised to be hired, 10 have been. In a day and age, the mental illnesses run rampant in the younger generations. Does it require a classmate almost dying in order to get support from the adults in our lives? The hypocrisy of the members of the Board of Education saying that they want to help students any way they can. They serve the students first, and to quote from Dr. McKnight, I am here for you and want to hear from you. Your voice matters and these are your schools. We are here to support your safety, growth, and learning. How? By ignoring our requests for mental health resources, by, cre by refusing to offer a competitive wage for social workers, thus creating a shortage of social workers who want to work for MCPS. No matter what you claim to be doing behind the scenes, if the students do not feel the actual benefit of your work, then what is it all for? I am urging you to take a closer look at our multi-billion dollar budget and remember that the children of this county are your priority. When you have students testifying every week that mental health resources are necessary, then you should listen and do everything in your power to get those resources to them. Thank you for your time. Good evening, uh, my name is Jimmy Perdomo and I am also a student leader at Magruder High School. Uh, the shooting that happened at Magruder has started discussions around my school on whether the mental health resources offered are enough. I want to tell you that they are not. At home, my mental health has never been discussed, so I've been forced to look for resources elsewhere. As a first generation student, my academic challenges have been nothing compared to my mental health struggles. There were points in my life where I had nobody to turn to for help, and this is the reality for many students as well. Fortunately, I was able to pull myself from this point in my life and actually become an advocate for student mental health. So when the opportunity came to become one of the founders for Colonel Minds Matter, a club that would focus on students' mental health, I took it. One of our main goals for this club was to destigmatize and raise awareness on mental health at our school. Later, I realized that this club would not be enough. No matter how many activities or meetings we hold, we cannot be the only ones who take the mental health crisis seriously. After asking students what the school could do to help their mental problems, many students said that they don't feel like the school wants to help them. This causes a greater divide between the school and students. And sure, our school counselors are supposed to help us with whatever problems we have, but one counselor per 250 students at a school is not enough. I mean, can you seriously expect one singular person to handle the lives of so many students? There is no way to ensure that with this, with this ratio of counselors to students, students will get adequate, uh, adequate help. At my school, our school psychologist has to travel between my school and another school during the week. Most of the students didn't even know that we had a school psychologist on site until after the shooting. 
MCPS needs to train all staff on how to appropriately reach out to students in a moment of crisis. You need to find a way for students to feel safe, protected, and appreciated, something that we haven't felt from MCPS in a very long time. We need the resources provided by the county to be better advertised. How are students supposed to know help is available when help isn't being promoted? We need better outreach. We need more funding to be placed into more counselors, school psychologists, and mental health training for staff. Please consider how much of an impact this will have on students' lives. The life wasn't, isn't the same as it was five years ago. Constant changes needed to ensure that students' lives are learning in a safe and welcoming environment. Please remember that your number one priority should always be the students. Thank you. Next, I would call Dan Fran, Alina Davison, and Ava Hernandez to the table. My name is Dan Tran, a 12th grader at Magruder High School. I come before you today to ask you for your support in developing a better communication system for what mental health resources are available to students. Compared to some of my peers from Magruder testifying, I'm not as informed as they are, nor am I as involved in county politics. As an average student not involved in county politics, I don't know what's available to me. I only know of the school counselors, limited homeroom time, weekly therapy dogs, and just recently, the psychologist who has an ambiguous schedule. Only two of those are direct methods of help. What can we turn to apart from those limited resources when we're struggling? Not many of us know. With everything that is going on in the world, with the amount of uncertainty and anxieties, students need an outlet. MCPS must develop better methods of communications with its students. Please understand that students are not going to be the most active. Not many will search for what's available they take in information that is on display for them. Even my peers, even some of my peers testifying, yes, the same ones involved in county politics, don't entirely know what's available to them. The county must broadcast and emphasize what mental health resources are available. Communicate with us. If there's something that already exists, the majority doesn't know about it. Students will not receive information without a large announcement. What we have in place is a system that does not reach the vast majority of students. Knowing and understanding what is available will better, better benefit and support our students. Please consider my words and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Davidson. Hi, my name is Elena Davison and I am currently a junior at Magruder High School. As many of you know, there is a recent incident in January where a student shot another student in the bathroom. I may not have been there, but all my friends and teachers were locked behind doors, unable to use the bathroom, unspeakable, unable to speak to their parents, and they were stuck in the building until 7 p.m. Although I cannot speak for them and their experience, I can very much say it was not pleasing hearing all my friends texting me saying that they loved me and that the shooter was in the building. The following week, we had one day where counseling and other mental health services were provided. Of course, it was nice to see a cute dog swarming the building every once in a while, but it definitely was not pleasant to walk into a school being congested with police and helicopters. After that day, it was back to normal, and my friends were still uncomfortable walking into six period. Why couldn't my friends have one day to rest? Why couldn't our voices be amplified for once? Because we all know this county does a great job at, rep at recognizing underrepresented schools like mine. Instead of listening to students from Magruder, I guess we all collectively decided to only listen to the moms on Facebook or Twitter who were complaining about SROs being taken out of schools. Just last month, I heard that we have a, that we have a psychologist in our school that doesn't even come for a full week. So instead, we were forced to go to our overworked counselors. Our expectations are not that high. We are not asking for an unlimited supply of social workers or psychologists. We also are not asking for police in our schools that statistically have shown unsafe environments. Except we are simply asking for a platform of reassurance for our mental health, which we feel has not been given to us. We are simply asking for an investment in our mental health and social workers. By investing, I mean long-term investments and not temporary ounces of welfare. My school is still recovering and I will not stop fighting until I know for sure that my classmates feel safe in their learning environment. Thank you. Ms. Hernandez. 
Hello, I'm Eva Hernandez, and I'm a freshman at Magruder High School, and I am here to uplift my school and its spirits. In an already declining mental health community, thrust upon by COVID and all that followed, approaching the issue with well-planned and effective strategies is vital. I will take advantage of this opportunity in order to spread awareness for the students that have been suffering and have not been acknowledged. The shooting had a detrimental effect, effect on students, but is only a fraction of what some have done. Providing counselors is an act of appreciated kindness, but was only enforced for around three days. Providing dogs every once in a while is masking the actual issue, the issue being that students need mental support. Mental health support is one thing, but mental health support for students in 2022 is a different situation entirely. It is no question that the amount of anxiety, depression, and PTSD of students in the present day is inevitable and immense. This quote came directly from a student from Magruder. I feel like the school system only cares about grades and could not care less about my mental health, end quote. It is unimaginable to think about the students that are looking for an outlet and not being able to get help in a place that is meant to be safe, supportive, and understanding. Modern actions need to be taken for modern problems. Understandably, learning is a top priority, but it is obvious that learning cannot take place in an environment where students do not feel safe, represented, or supported. Many services can be provided, and all it takes is the adults to sympathize and put themselves in the position of students. Things like an anonymous counseling hotline, mental health days, disclosed psychologists, anything that makes students feel protected and safe in their environment are actions that can be taken for the benefit of a student's life quality. It should be an, an effort to make, a mental health, to make mental health a priority in the school climate. On the behalf of students, please listen when we ask for a safe space to understand our emotions and to be able to take actions in order to preserve and better our mental health. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next is Marilyn Erdheim, Natalie King, and Eugene Choi. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Marin Erdheim, and I'm a senior at Magruder High School. I've been a student athlete for four years. Sports have always been a help to my mental health, and following the incident on Magruder at, on January 21st, having teammates and coaches to turn to was more helpful than ever. I found that talking to teammates was much more beneficial than the discussions that were held in our six periods the following Tuesday. Nobody really had anything to say, and the counselors had little to no information to give us. I had to substitute in my sixth period the day of the shooting, and I am so thankful that he followed protocol where I know other teachers did not. With so much anxiety arising after this, and with mental health recently having a big impact on my own family, sports have helped relieve that and given me an outlet to release these tensions and anxieties. In addition to increasing the availability of school psychologists and other mental health resources, it is equally important to prioritize ways in which students' mental health may be indirectly impacted. Where students may not be comfortable seeking out their counselor or discussing with classmates, especially after experiencing trauma, there's often increased comfort levels with teammates and coaches where those connections and bonds have already formed. It is so important for the county to prioritize athletic programs and make them as e equitable as possible, as well as continuing to make mental health of all students and staff a priority. Participation in sports is varied throughout the county with lower participation at schools with higher farms rates. Why is it that so many schools can't even field full teams? As seen in the most recent OLO report on sports and gender and MCPS, there are many inequities throughout our county when it comes to sports, which is a great disservice to MCPS students who need more help and access to various types of mental health support. MCPS needs to prioritize increasing participation in programs where it is currently lacking, providing equal opportunities to good coaches, equipment and facilities, and giving athletes a free spectator pass to all student athletes so everyone can have someone to support them at their events without it being a financial burden. It has been proven that participation in athletics plays a huge part in keeping kids safe and can play an active role in improving the mental health of students. It is time that the county take the mental health of students and their staff seriously and make investments where it is needed to do so. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Natalie Keene, and I am a sophomore and one of the many Magruder students who has seen and felt the repercussions of school on mental health. Instead of reminiscing about what happened on the horrific day in January, I want to shed light on the aftermath that students still battle and face on their own. I have asked many of my fellow classmates to share their experiences and perspectives of how they feel that day has affected them and their opinions on how the school has been handling mental health overall. 
One of my classmates claims, I think that the school didn't do enough to help students with what happened. We were given one half day uh, for mental health and then we were expected to go back to just normal school after. Many students like them believe that we should be, we should have more time off to process and cope with not only the situation, but overall. Nothing much has changed and our resources remain the same. I'm supported by many other students when I say the resources feel insig insignificant, unengaging, and repetitive. It isn't enough. My mental health does not feel enough inside and out of the classroom. Another, another of my peers strongly believes that the half-hour unstructured homerooms are not going to teach a person to rewrite their habits and build a better version of themselves. Therefore, we need to be exceedingly educated on what mental health what mental illness is and how it can affect the modern teenager, not by an early president. We need to inform our communities of how they can individually build positive life habits. We need to walk students through the beginning levels of mental rehabilitation, expanding and creating more one-on-one -on -one time for students to express themselves and seek aid is imperative to prioritizing wellness. Schools should not be there to aid in uh, schools should be there to aid in a healthy, successful future and fun memories, not to raise the question of whether we will have a tomorrow. We are the future of tomorrow. Thank you for your time. Good evening, board, and to those attending, thank you for being here. My name is Eugene Choi, uh, and I'm a junior at Magruder High School. I'm here today to echo demands that my classmate Himanshu and other students at Magruder High School have continued to express before and after the incident that occurred at my school. When my sixth period classroom went into a full lockdown on a Friday afternoon in January, the belief was that we would soon be out of what was presumed to be a drill. Six hours later, the reality was police sirens, helicopter blades, and heavily armed law enforcement officers lining the hallways of our school. In the aftermath of what happened, I was not shaken by fear, but more so by the fact that a fellow student had brought a gun into what I believed was a secure learning environment and shot a fellow student. This is a separate issue that must be addressed by the implementation of security measures in our schools to go hand in hand with mental health support, something that is supported by other student incidents at schools like Blair, Northwest, and Wooten. In response to the incident, students were given one abbreviated day to emotionally regroup and talk to counselors brought in from other schools, the last time Magruder would ever have that many psychologists and counselors available for students at once. What we need most right now for the well-being of our students are not temporary solutions, but greater access to mental health resources like investing in more school psychologists to meet the demands of all students who are suffering from incidents like this. We need to discuss things like mental health breaks incorporated into our school schedules to allow students to recuperate and prioritize their wellness. We need to work towards expanding counseling services to ease the burden of work that counselors have every day so they can be available resources for all of our students. The students at all 208 schools in this county and their well-being should be the number one priority. And if a portion of our $2.7 billion budget cannot be spared for the emotional wellness of students, then there is a serious issue with the objectives of this school district. We will continue to stand here and demand the resources and support necessary for student well-being until we see direct action from the board. We cannot have another incident like this, and as student leaders, we will not stand by, watch our peers struggle, and stay silent about it. In a school district that is the largest in the state and one of the highest funded in the entire country, where almost $16,000 are provided to each student, does it take traumatic Thank incidents? Thank you. We have your testimony. <laughs> Next is Samantha Ross, Baba Cisse, and Christina McCann. Hello board, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sam Ross and I'm a ninth grader at Montgomery Blair High School. I'd quickly like to recognize the Magruder students today and their incredible activism. I'm appalled today at the lack of regard for student voice and the decision to end the mask mandate in MCPS schools. A decision which you would assume should include students above all, 
the key stakeholders who this decision would influence. Yet remarkably, there was no general poll of students. In fact, the only stakeholder engagement you did was at Miss O'Looney's Small Advisory Council, a council of which I am a general member, where every single student who spoke up to the staff there, who at the time was saying that MCPS would send out a general survey for students to gauge opinion on masks, said that the decision should not go forward without adequate polling and consideration of the greater student voice. That vote did go forward, and it seems the vo vote went forward for no better reason than peer pressure from parents, the state government, and unrelated political noise. In fact, the vote went forward with no stipulations, no guidance beyond the simple don't be mean to someone based on their mask choice, and seemingly no thought on how use of masks differs by any number of factors, and how the end of the mandate could be bad for those, and how to support students when it ended. I go in and out of a school every single day with about 3.5 thousand other people. Some rooms have no air filter. Sometimes I'm shoulder to shoulder in the halls. I ask you, if you were a student, would you feel safe there? Do you know how many students will feel safe there? You never asked. I am not here to give any opinion about masks. I am not here to tell anyone that their personal beliefs and choices about masks are bad. I am here to say that our student voice should not be a second choice. We should not be an afterthought to the possibility of poor press if you lifted the mask mandate after spring break in order to actually put into place plans of what to do when it ended. I know you won't walk back the mask decision. I know it's highly unlikely it will ever be changed, but going forward, I want to remind everyone that you don't go into school every day. The adults who harass pro mask students don't go into school every day. In fact, no adults besides our staff go into school every day. Our neighboring counties don't go into school every day and the state government doesn't go into school every day. But I go to school every day and I'm here and I want you to listen to us. Thank you for your time. My name is Baba Sise, a junior at Albert Einstein High School. I'm an IB diploma candidate student at my school, a varsity athlete, and class SGA vice president. As you can see, I have a lot on my plate with innumerable responsibilities daily. Oftentimes, I get so absorbed in my schoolwork, having practice after school, and then coming home to the responsibilities that being the oldest of three siblings entail. At the end of the day, I'm left feeling drained both physically and mentally. Oftentimes, I and many hardworking students around the county overlook something very important, our mental health. This is, for many of us, our first time being back in person school after a year and a half of virtual instruction. Although it's been a full semester, many of us have not quite adjusted back to being in a traditional learning environment after so long, waking up earlier than what we were, what, than what we were adjusted to, keeping up with a steady stream of assignments, having the pressure of schools imposing harder classes on students, enjoying the relief of after school extracurriculars after a long day at school. These differences have weighed heavily on our students' mental health around the county. This year alone, since January, we've had nine students in the county who have lost their lives due to homicide this year in MCPS. We need to start asking ourselves, is the addition of SROs going to solve the issues after they've already happened? We collectively see the mental and emotional strains of our students. However, an officer would not be my first choice to talk to about my mental health struggles. Are we going to finally take the necessary steps to create an MCPS that is proactive to prevent situations from occurring rather than reactive to a situation that has and will happen without the proper mental health services for our students. We have held back for too long, but now we are urging for change. The change that would benefit me and my peers, my siblings, and the future of MCPS. You've heard us crying out. You've heard the voices at BCC crying out. You heard the voices at Northwest and Blair crying out. You heard the voices at Magruder crying out. You've heard the voices from around the county cry out. So I ask you, will you stand up and hear the and meet the cries for help? Thank you. Um, trigger warnings of queer phobia and suicidality. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and board members. My name is Christina McCann, and I use they, she pronouns. I'm a non-binary trans person, and for most of the school year, I worked a day job at Parkland Magnet Middle School as a TPT paraeducator. I'm probably going to cry. <laughs> strong. Growing up, thank you. Growing up as a student in MCPS, I rarely got in trouble. I was an overachiever involved in MCRSGA. Theater, Girl Scouts, people expected a lot from me and I did a, a, what I thought I needed to do to win their approval. When I graduated MCPS and came out as bi, I was able to explore who I really want to be. I realized I'm trans and since coming out as such, I've experienced more hate than ever. I suddenly went from a child who never got in trouble to an adult who was called into my principal's office to be cautioned after I put students' pronouns on a seating chart and made a coworker uncomfortable. That same week, some of my students found my Instagram and sent me queerphobic slurs. I'm currently on unpaid leave after those students called me the F slur and other disgusting names like Miss Mangina. According to MCPS, I am a, quote, disruption to the school day, and this incident doesn't warrant a community letter. 
Last month, I was investigated due to my podcast, and in my meeting with the head of compliance and investigations, I was compared to a stripper and slut shamed. I was told my podcast about sex, gender, and queer identity was not a PR issue for MCPS, but rather a moral issue for me. These are only a few instances of discrimination I've experienced here, and I'm told it's mild in comparison to what others have endured. According to the Trevor Project, half of trans youth ages 13 to 24 seriously considered ending their lives in the past year. I am one of them. You need to do better. Please release a statement against the anti-trans and gay bills across the country. Provide real support for queer staff and students. Make yearly competency trainings mandatory. Hire queer people in leadership positions. You owe us a safe space to work and learn. Thank you. Thank you. Next is William Richborg, Hesse Harris, and Sora Edwards Throw. William Richborg. Hesse Harris, you could start. Good afternoon, Madam President. Members of the board. Please turn your microphone on. Press the button. At the, no, down here. Under the mic. Under the mic. Under the mic. Right. Got it. Okay. Good afternoon. Madam President, members of the board, and attendees, I'm Hesse Harris, and I'm here to speak about school safety in the person of the SRO. Got two brief stories. In 2019, a 16-year-old California high school student on his birthday went to school, shot and shot and killed two fellow students, injuring four, including himself, whom he shot in the head. The whole thing took 16 seconds. This month, a 13-year-old student in Washington State came to school with a gun, a hundred rounds of ammunition, and a kill list in his backpack. He told several students his plans. They were concerned and told the teacher, who informed the administrators, who then called the police. They got there in time to arrest and disarm the student. What would have happened if the would-be assassin had not disclosed his plans? They don't always, as we know. What would have happened if the student had not gotten to the teacher in time, or the teacher to the administrators in time, or the police gotten there in time to disarm and arrest the student would-be shooter? This rate relay that we're talking about, depending on the circumstances, could be between five and 15 minutes. It's and remember, this, the uh, earlier massacre took 16 seconds. It's not hard to imagine the terror of a parent rushing into a school after hearing of a shooting while pray, crying, praying, and hoping that their child or children are not among the dead, dying, or wounded. The odds of that not being the case, I'm speaking of the shooting, are greatly enhanced to SROs are present. They help keep matters from morphing into tragedy. In many instances, they are the person that the troubled teen would be trouble teen would have turned to for help rather before the situation became a crisis. Columbine was 22 years ago. Yet, but nearly once a month, or sometimes more often, there is another school shooting. Thank you. We uh, have your we have your comments. Thank you, uh, Ms. Throw. Good afternoon. I'm Sora Edwards Rowe. I'm an autistic self advocate who works with neurodivergent children, pushing for anti violent learning. I know that when a kid is in school, they're constantly receiving messages about who they are and what they could or could not become. When we station police and security guards in schools, the message we send to black and brown students is we see you as criminals. It becomes clear that school isn't a place to learn or grow or express yourself, it's a militarized space where in order to survive, you'd better stay in line. Police and guards go against everything necessary to make schools actually safe. Trust, mutual respect, dialogue, their very presence, whether they're in the building or down the street and a phone call away, undermines all those possibilities and creates an atmosphere where students are problems and the only solution is violence. I remember being hyper aware as a student that because I'm autistic, I had to be very careful about how anything I did could be perceived. Instead of getting to play, make mistakes, and get support from grown-ups in repairing them. 
When my brother was singled out by the school police as a suspect one time, I was terrified for him. I think a lot about how the consequences and risks would have been so much higher if he had been a black boy. We owe our students, teachers, staff, and parents the opportunity to, the opportunity to experience a true school community, one where all learners matter and the goal is learning and safety, not control. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Howard Sachs. Howard Sachs. Howard Sachs. Okay, we have <clears throat> received one video testimony from Emily Bannister. Please play the audio. Hi, my name is Emily Dubana Bannister and I'm a resident of Montgomery County and a proud Arab American. My parents immigrated to the U.S. from both Jordan and Palestine. I attended MCPS schools myself, kindergarten through high school. I now have two younger children, one of whom began kindergarten the school year. Therefore, I'm very much invested in this community and hope to elevate the voices of minorities in this county. I'd like to start by thanking the board for continuing their recognition of Arab American Heritage Month in April and pay tribute to the contributions of Arab Americans. We are poets, we are scientists, we are activists, we are policymakers, but above all, we're human. Some of these individuals are known in pop culture and there are also many who don't make headlines but are just as impactful. The Hadid sisters, Bella and Gigi, while they're models, they work greatly with UNICEF, providing humanitarian aid to children worldwide. Rashida Talib is the daughter of Palestinian immigrants who made history as the first Muslim woman elected to the Michigan legislature and one of the first women to serve in the U.S. Congress. Fadi Joda is a Palestinian American and a physician, a poet, and a translator. His debut poetry collection won the Yale series of Younger Poets Competition. Geologist and space scientist Farouk El Baz is credited with discovering groundwater resources in the Middle East, and he also worked with NASA on the scientific exploration of the moon and planning the Apollo program. Steve Jobs, who we all have heard of, is also half Syrian and the head and co-founder of Apple. Khalil Gibran, Lebanese-born writer and poet, is the third best-selling poet of all time. Salma Hayek, Jenna Dewan, Shakira, Paula Abdul, these are all Arab Americans as well. Their parents are immigrants of Lebanon and Syria, and we've seen them on our TV screens and listened to them on the radio. There are some of the many, many Arab Americans, and I wanted to thank for their contributions, not only to the Arab world, but to our community, as they have paved the way and made dreams a reality. I hope others are inspired to do great things as these individuals have done and are just as proud to recognize their roots. Thank you. This concludes our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comment is Thursday, April the 7th. Sign-ups will begin Thursday, March the 31st. Okay. Yes. I will now take comments from my fellow board members. I'll start on this side with Ms. Epp. Sure. Just want to thank everyone for coming out today um, to give testimony, particularly our students um, from Magruder around mental health. I just need you to know that we do care, we do hear you, we are listening. Every single budget, we have made it a priority to include mental health supports, but I'm just gonna be honest, we can never do enough. We have 160,000 students, and um, I did hear um, a, a student quote that, you know, one counselor per 250 students is not not enough, and we do know we do know that, right? Um, and so we're working to try to make adjustments to include um, more counselors, more school psychologists. I would like to have someone come to the board table just to talk again about what we've added in this year's budget around mental health supports, and then and then um, I heard several students talking about not being aware of what supports are out there. So sharing that information and then coming up with a plan um, around how to get this information out to our students, because it's there, but we need you to know, because if you don't know, um, it won't help you. But just know that it is there and we are continuing to do um, more and more each budget cycle and it's a priority not only for our school board for our superintendent but for our county council and our county executive as well and so we have a lot of things in the works um, it all can't come quick enough but just know that it's coming and that there are probably some immediate things that we could do and this is off 
the cuff off top. I mean, just a little bit, something that we had not planned, but can we talk about maybe having a town hall to discuss how our students are feeling mm -hmm. and just really um, make certain that we continue to include their voices. Um, we do make certain that um, our students' voices are raised and highlighted and that your voices are heard, but we can never do enough to make certain that you know there are students that we don't always hear from that they feel like they can have their voices included and you have a student member on the board who represents you very well who who um did an impromptu um what she will do impromptu <laughs> polling on social media she tries very successfully to me to put out information in layman's terms to our students to know what happened at each board meeting, meeting what's going on. She does small minutes, but we can always do more. And we want you to know that that is a priority and we are doing more, but we can never do enough and we'll continue to do that. So I'll just let staff um, address some of the questions that we all heard during the testimony. Just, just want to echo some of the concerns that Ms. Evans has raised. And I wonder, because there seems to be an issue around students knowing what's available, this is not the first time that we've heard this. I mean, this seems to be a continuing issue. I'm wondering if we can convene a student group to figure out the best way to communicate the, the information about what's available, because somehow there's some disconnect. It's, it, there are things available, but the students don't seem to know it. So maybe we need to ask them the best way to get that information out. Just a thought. Um, did they come to talk about it? Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Davis. Be before they start, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to our students for coming forward and sharing your truth. Um, that is always a value of what we will put up front in the school system. So I want to thank you for that and ask that you continue to do just what you did. Um, I say that because we've heard some of what you have been saying, and I'm going to add on to the great recommendations that were made by uh, Ms. Evans and Board President Wolf. When we come back and the team is here prepared to talk about what we've done, and I know this is only one part of it because it's not everything, and I just want to be up front saying that. What we will do is add on to what your request was, was the communication plan. And prior to us doing that, I am directing the team to follow up with the students to say, what will this communication plan look like that speaks to the way in which you need the communication? So I'm saying that to you, I'm saying it to the team, so that when we come back together and we share what we're doing, when we have more time to do that, we will share how it is being communicated with students and families, because sure. we've also heard that as well. Families as well as students want to know exactly what these services are. Um, and also acknowledge that this is a part of the work that we will be building out. So there are some things that we are doing now. There will be ways in which we add on to that. We've shared that in our ESSER funding in many different ways, and the team will speak to that. And it has to be a priority in our budget and our grant funding moving forward. But we need your help to build it. And so the stories and the narratives that you shared today are critical. And last night, I have to elevate our student forum. We had so many students, and I was, had the opportunity to listen to the wellness group. And across every single table, there were some trends that spoke to some similar, very similar things that students wanted, and very different. So what we know about student wellness is that it needs to be differentiated, because how we define and look at wellness is very different for every individual. And we need to be that strategic and that specific in how we build that out. And that will take time, but it's time we're committed to doing alongside and with you. So thank you for your testimony, and thank you in advance for your work with you and many others moving forward to help us do that. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, but I appreciate the team being flexible to come up forward. If you all could just briefly share what some of those services are um, that we've put in place, and then some of the things that we are working on um, that we would benefit from having them help us map out. Mr. Mattilioni. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McKnight. And to the students, to echo, having sat in the principal's seat for the last seven years at Richard Montgomery High School now being here, I, and having my own students in 11th and, and 8th grade, I, I applaud you. Um, and it's your voices that make change, and I just appreciate that. And I also would say that I had the opportunity to meet with some of the students in this room and others for 
better part of a, more than a half hour uh, talking specifically about some of the supports that were um, not consistently being implemented after the tragedy at Magruder, and we were able to get some additional folks out there. And, and so we'll have some folks up here speak to that. We'll have some folks speak to some of the additional um, you know, budgetary pieces we put in around counseling and psychological services. And I can certainly speak to some of the, the strategic implementation innovation plans that we are working on and building as we speak. So I don't know if we want to begin. No, thank you uh, for this opportunity. And, and number one, I want to thank our students. I, I approach this table with a sense of empathy, um, both as a parent of a high schooler uh, and also as someone who has served the Magruder Cluster faithfully for six years, just thinking, uh, including uh, one of my former students who was here to present and having conversations with Amashu when I was there. And I want to thank Dr. Evans and Dr. Vega. I see also Dr. Serga in the audience for being a support with this work even prior to this incident and, and trying to make um, Magruder into a trauma-informed school. I think that's important to know and being working very closely with our team in order to do that. So talking about work that is prior, ongoing, and moving forward. Uh, I wanted to share, and I know I have some of my team members that are here as well, what is some of the current work to answer your question, Dr. McKnight, that's going on specifically uh, to, to really elevate this for the students at Magruder. I know Hamachu and I had a time uh, when we, we met in order for me to share, but I think it's important for everyone to know that we do have several uh, supports that are in place. Number one, uh, we are working with our Jewish Social Services Agency, also known as JESA, uh, to provide additional supports to our students at Magruder. I think that's important for our students and families to know. Uh, we are also working with our Street Outreach Network, uh, working very closely with our partners in DHHS. I know as Dr. McKnight has said, we work very closely. It's important and coming upon us that we're working with our partners, our community partners. We also have a uh, social worker team from our restorative justice, and, and I can let Ms. Jormby speak more about that, who is going out on a regular basis, and she can tell at least tw twice per week uh, to provide supports, and that will continue to increase. Uh, in addition to our social workers, I think I heard the numbers when some of our students were speaking uh, that we've only hired 10. We've actually hired over 22, uh, currently 26, I believe, as, uh, as of today. So I think that's important for everyone to know uh, that we are making our way towards ensuring that we do have a social worker, not just, I know I was speaking specific to Magruder, but it's important for all of our families and students to know uh, the entire community that we're working to provide that resource for all. Uh, in addition to continuing hiring our counselors, as well as our psychologists, uh, school psychologists as well, which I can ask uh, Dr. Chester is here to speak to that as well. But that's just some of the current work. Uh, no, we are not there. It's an ongoing work. Uh, I think I heard the students say two of the statements, many of the statements that you all said that resonated with me, but number one, our number one priority is and continues to be our students and that you all are the future of tomorrow. So in order for us to make sure that that future is in the right place and can support us, we must ensure the well-being, safety, and security of every single one of you. So I'm, I'm going to stop right there. I, I want to turn it over to Dr. Chester and also to Ms. Jornby to add as well. So good afternoon, members of the board, Dr. McKnight. Um, I am I'm thankful to be able to come and speak to you today about some of the supports that we are putting in place um, around mental health within our schools. Um, as was stated by um, Mr. Davis, um, we are continuing to hire um, school psychologists um, to increase the amount of psychological services that are being able to, that are able to be provided um, within our schools. Um, we actually just had interviews today. Um, so we have um, interviewed um, over 15 school psychologists um, and have provided um, offers out to them in order to be able to increase the amount of services and mental health services that we are providing within our schools. Um, as we said before that we do have um, JESA, um, which is our outside agency that has been providing um, a significant amount of additional mental health support, especially in our communities that we call mental health deserts. We know that in Montgomery County there are communities that have a lot of community resources for mental health and there are communities that have none. And so in us looking at analyzing those communities that don't have have the resources for families to be able to take their students um, to go out and receive mental health support. Um, we have contracted with JESA to provide both in-person and telehealth services um, to schools um, so that students can go forth and get the mental health support um, that they need. Um, they are currently serving 17 schools 
and that we hope that with additional funding that we'll be able to increase and expand um, the amount of services that are provided either through JESSA or even additional um, agencies um, that can provide both in-person and telehealth support to students as Ms. Aluni has frequently stated in meetings that we do want to be able so that when students come to the counseling suite requesting mental health support due to something that is immediate um, that we can go forth and provide that support to them because um, we know that um, you know we know that counselors are busy um, we know that in the past like psychologists have had multiple buildings I know as that Magruder students have shared um, their psychologist there does have the, the high school and an elementary school um, so we our goal is especially for next year as we continue to hire um, for like Magruder to have the, the person be there full-time um, and so and to be able to continue to support um, students and their mental health needs we also have our our minds matter clubs um, which are are currently in 17 of our high schools and we are piloting it in two of our middle schools our goal is to expand um, this this group this is a student-led mental health advocacy group that can continue to help to destigmatize mental health in our schools because while we can have folks there to help to provide support to our students if they feel like going to seek out help will make them look bad or all of a sudden like I can't do this because my family is going to look at me funny or my friends are going to look at me funny they're not going to seek it out so having clubs like this um, that students help to run um, that can help us in order to get information out to the, our students and the public um, around um, the need for mental health services that and that it's okay to go forth and talk to somebody and so for those schools out there you're hearing like well maybe my high school doesn't have it we are always looking to expand we do want it in all of our high schools. And so our goal is just to find the students um, that can help to support those clubs in the high school level and for us to expand it um, at our middle school level next year. And so our counselors and our psychologists have been big advocates in being sponsors of those clubs um, so that they can go forth and students can come and participate. They were even in one of the club at um, Watkins Mill last year was highlighted on the Today Show um, for the work that they're doing. And so we're really excited about Our Minds Matter. I know a student came and spoke about it um, at the um, SMOB, um, the board meeting um, last night. Um, and then in addition, as you know, I come forth and we talk about, because while we are providing mental health supports, it's not just the amount of like targeted or intensive support that our mental health staff is, but what are we doing around social emotional learning? Because having that universal support helps to teach students the skills in order to be able to cope, to become more resilient. And so as you know, I know I've been working with Magruder team and talking around our trauma-informed practices. As Mr. Davis said, even before the pandemic, we were meeting um, and providing training and support to the staff and trying to put universal supports in place around trauma-informed care. Um, that having SEL in our schools, like our Leader Me, which Magruder is in cohort two and we'll be implementing that next year, um, that having curriculum like that helps to give schools some of the foundational skills needed in order to prevent mental illness, because that is our overall goal, right? Because while, yes, we do want to be able to provide support for those who have mental illness, if we can prevent it and create mentally healthy students, um, our SEL curriculum is there um, to provide that continued support. So thank you for that, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Rambi. Good afternoon, uh, members of the board, Dr. McKnight, and to everyone in our audiences. Um, first, I want to once again acknowledge the students and their bravery, the boldness, and the courage that it takes to speak up. Much of what you said today and last night and throughout the year has been heard, and we, we hear you and we see you. Um, today, it was my distinct pleasure to follow up with some of our same students, um, not just from last night, with them on site at their schools. And that's something that we do regularly in, in our unit, Student Engagement, Behavioral Health and Academics, as well as throughout all of OTLS. Um, and I want to talk to you about one specific lane. There's many things that we can talk about to support mental health and wellness, but I want to focus on social workers today to, to keep the focus. Um, so beginning with Magruder, um, our RJ unit social worker, Anita Garcia, 
is there every Tuesday and Thursday, and we have nods because we've asked, um, we've had requests to keep her permanently. Um, and she's there every Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> Thursday all day uh, to support our students. And that doesn't include just direct service and talk therapy, but also referrals out. So some of the service that happens might not be service that you see, right? What I get is the, the link that says, this has been completed, family has been placed. This has been completed, the family will be placed in two weeks when the waiting list clears. So I want you to know no, it's not just what we see, but it's also the unseen. Um, as we onboard new social workers, they do train with Anita at Magruder. For example, uh, you might have noticed this week <coughs> that you had four different social workers on site, and that's because that's a part of the onboarding process. Next week, we have four new ones that start again, that we on-site them at Magruder because we know that you need the service and they need to get to know our children. So I want you to know that that's a service that's going to continue uh, all the way till the end of the school year. So I know you may not feel like the support is, is there, but we do see you and we do care about you. And, and we do want to ensure that not only that that continues, that you have something more permanent. And so when we are looking to match and place your specific social workers we hire, we have clear criteria that we've worked with the counseling supervisors to devise, including language spoken, specialties, et cetera. So we don't leave you with just what's there in the moment, but something that will serve your community specifically. So that's to Magruder. Um, to, to, to Baba Sisa Ibrahim, we spoke yesterday about the important work of destigmatizing a mental health and the, the um, presentations and work groups that we do with parents around that. And your social workers within your school can do that. And your social worker, Sanaida Sharif Ture, is amazing, multilingual, and she is there. She is serving currently, and that's something that we can do for the population at Einstein. Generally speaking, and overall, um, social workers, sometimes we need to draw the curtains back and not just for our adults, um, uh, because we did have a, a PTSA meeting at Magruder just last week, which we presented. But also, I'm realizing just as importantly for our students. And uh, what that means is sharing as much as we can with you. So some of the things that you stated, a competitive wage. So we have reduced the number of social workers from 50 to 30 because our social workers prior to now were 10 months. They're on a teacher schedule. And so by making them 12 months, um, including more work days, provides more planning and, and time to new, meet students in the summer, but also increases the salary by almost 20%, which makes us far more competitive. Um, that's, that's to o OHRD's credit, that's, that's not something that I think um, people have been dissatisfied with. We have provided a competitive wage and we've heard much about that. Um, in terms of recruitment, instead of just hiring, we prioritize the needs of our communities and realized quickly that a social worker supervisor was necessary to building a career ladder for students. And so today, Stephanie uh, Wallace was appointed as a social worker supervisor in this very room who will do great things to support our students and the growth and development of our social workers in MCPS. In addition, of the 32 remaining positions, 26 have been hired, 26. And many have begun that work. That work doesn't include the one week of onboarding at Magruder and with the RJ team, but also a meeting with myself, with the principal, the resource counselor, to get those plans in place. I also want to share with you students and something that I'm learning. It is not enough to just hire, right? We have to train. We have to onboard. We have to provide materials, resources. They need professional reference materials, um, assessment materials. So while funding has been provided for social workers, the other pieces are still just as important. And we have, we have taken that from a number of places, including from the RJ budget, from this budget, from that budget, to ensure that when they get there, they're effective and they're equipped. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm, a commitment that I'm making to you today and that our entire team makes to you is that they are there. And if they're not there, they're coming. And not only will they come, they'll be prepared. They'll be supervised, there'll be structures. I wanna also add that uh, social workers earning clinical licensure can now do that in MCPS. They could not do that before. 
Stephanie Wallace, our supervisor, who is board certified, makes that entirely possible, which means that we can grow not just clinical social workers, but LMSWs with their master's degree. In addition to that, we have recruited many of them. We were with Morgan University this week, Howard University two weeks ago, University of Maryland next week, um, La not Lafayette, Fayette State the week after. So we are getting them from all over. And more than that, since we've been recruiting at universities, what we've gotten is much outreach about interns. So now it's an addition, but we have interns to place that are finishing their second year of uh, social work, which requires 16 hours of placement with you, servicing you in group therapy or individual case management. And we can only do that because the structures are in place to do that, not just the positions. So I want you to feel encouraged. I want you to feel confident. I want you to feel seen. We will do a better job of drawing back that curtain more often and communicating to you what is there, what we are doing, what we are planning, and when you will see it. And I ask you to hold us to that. Thank you. Thank you for all of you stopping by and, and sharing that information. Um, we're not going to take questions of the team because they, they just came by to speak to the students. But we will continue with board comments on what you heard. So thank you very much. Thank I also you. want to uh, note that Dr. Evans is here. Yes, he is. And he has to be very proud of his yeah. students. And <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you that I'm so glad to see you here supporting them. <clears throat> That's very important that they see that you're here supporting them, too. So at this time, Dr. Daka had her light on next. Yeah, I did. Uh, and then I'm not after gonna, that is Ms. O'Looney. I'm not going to take up a lot of time, but I know that Magruder in our minds has always been a gem that people didn't know about in the school system and about the wonderful programs and the terrific principal whom I've known since he was a little boy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I want to thank the students for sharing their feelings and uh, talking about the things that they think should be done. And we have heard from students for a long time, and we're trying to do a better job of this. But I think the team being here today has yes. been so excellent because they are talking specifically about programs that you can get into. And <clears throat> you, uh, there are adults in your building. We hope that everybody in the building has one adult that he or she can speak with. Uh, about anything at all. Um, I'm just delighted that we had them last night. We also had them working with students with um, Hannah Oluni's efforts with MCR, and uh, it's very important. And having the numbers of people who have been hired and how they're onboarding them and that they are uh, looking at interns, this has really been so helpful. And I'm not going to go any more uh, about this because I think other people have said some really uh, cogent things. Um, but the other part of our um, comments had to do with Arab American Heritage Week. And I want to thank Ms. Uh, Samira Hussein, who spoke here, but she also started the program at Georgetown and she always provides training for our teachers uh, once, at least once a year to understand what it is that they could teach about Arab Americans and the contributions of Arab Americans. And I'm wearing my Arab American jacket, which is from Palestine. Thank you. Ms. O'Looney. Yeah, I mean, what a way for students to show up today. I think this is the most students I've ever seen at a board meeting <laughs> um, in my time here. Yeah, no, claps to that. Um, I think what particularly stood out to me today was a comment from Grace, if she's still here, um, about how we talk so often about mental health support and all the resources and the tens of millions of dollars that we pump into it every single year at the sport table and at central office. But if our students continue to come here and say that they don't feel anything or see anything or know about any of those resources that we're making such a great investment in, then that's a signal that we need to change our strategy. And that's a signal that we need to speak with our students and, and hear their experiences. So I really hope that after today we can continue to consult with our wonderful nine students from Magruder and others who, who came out to testify today. And I'm also, I was surprised no one on the panel mentioned the $1.6 million that we added into next year's budget for telehealth psychological services for students. I think that's going to be a huge 
huge win for students and being able to access a professional at any time during the school day um, and a great example of how we can use limited resources to reach a greater number of students but thank you thank you thank you to our students for coming out tonight thank you am i seeing any other lights yes. miss harris yes um i do i want to echo what hana said about thanking the students for coming out but I, you know, I also want to share that I, I, I really share your frustration because I feel like we've been having the same conversation over and over. Um, we had a, a night with students on December 15th, heard many of these same concerns. We had a special meeting on February 10th, heard the same concerns. Um, last night again, we had a meeting with students, heard similar concerns, and you all. And echoing what Hannes said, um, they're, they're telling us what they need. And when they keep coming back to us to say the same things, we don't see the services, we don't know what exists, we don't know how to access what's there, what's there doesn't feel accessible to us, then this is a pervasive problem that we have not yet addressed. And I, I, I don't want these students to just be paying it forward. I really want us to see, getting to the accountability piece that um, Ms. Silvestri speaks to so, so often and so well, we hear, we heard some really great things, but I, can we build some real methodology of regularly coming back and reporting to these students what's happening in real time so they don't have to come back and ask and share that they don't know, they don't see it. Um, because we're making investments now, we're also making investments in the future, but they really, sh really shouldn't be waiting still to see the needs of themselves and their peers met. And the other concern that I think we continue to hear in, from many students in many venues is that each of our schools doing individual things around social emotional learning, what's becoming clear to me is that one size is not gonna fit all. And we hear different strategies and different ideas coming from different students in the same school. Some want just just give me a time where I don't have to do anything, nobody talks to me. And others are saying, can we have some real, you know, real meaningful, ex you know, accessible to us information about we mental wellness and, and what, what depression looks like and how I can be a resource. So different students need different things. And it, this just gets back to me thinking, our schools need to really partner with our students to ask what they need and what they think would be a good use of this identified time and make more and not try to put a square peg in a round hole. Every student has to have the same, you have, that time has to be used for every student the same way. Um, because again, that gets to what we need to do to differentiate and recognize that all of our students are unique and they come to us in different ways and in, from different places. So anyway, but the accountability piece to me not just for us as board members charged with that oversight, but for these folks right here and over there because, you know, they're the customers and they're the only ones who can tell us how well we're doing, what we say we're doing. Thank you, Ms. Harris. And I completely agree, which is why I think we need a student work group to talk about how to get the message to them in a way that they actually receive it because however we've been doing it isn't quite getting the message out. And there are things available. We know that, but other people don't seem to know that. Ms. Saluni, did you have another comment? Yeah, just one last thing. Um, I would love if someone could follow up with Ms. McCann about her experiences. I think uh, staff mental health is just important, just as important as student mental health. So I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're up to item number six. I'm going to ask Dr. McKnight to proceed. All right, thank you so much, President Wolf. Um, what a healthy conversation we had after public comment. All right, I will ask for us to transition and have our team from International Admissions and Enrollment join us at the board table. All right, we will go ahead. Thank you so much, it's so good to see you all. Um, 
I'm excited about this presentation today because this has been a, a, a really significant discussion that we've been having in the school system over the past year. And we've gotten a lot of feedback from our community members. We've done a lot of things internally to address what some of the areas of focus has been. And I also personally had a chance to go out and spend some time at our International Admissions Office, which was such a valuable experience um, for me. As a matter of fact, um, it was Ms. Samira that I actually met there and you know saw her volunteering and, and just doing work to make sure we were making the connections with the family. So I, I, it was just, again, a powerful experience. And I say that it is because of the people who have such a deep commitment to our community and actually thinking about everything that needs to be taken into consideration as they come into having the families who come into MCPS for first time in this country having a valuable experience. I also learned from many of the staff members that that has become their life's work because they had that experience. So I just say that is something that we should be really proud of in our school system, that we've had staff members who um, uh, you know, or have come into Montgomery County as international students or families at some point in time, and they're there serving our families. And I just want to thank you for that. And of course, the leadership of Mr. Davis and Ms. Bohork has in just working with the staff to do so. It has truly been amazing. So with that said, uh, today you're going to hear more about that and how that work has happened. We're going to provide updates on enrollment for our emergent multilingual learners through the collaborative work between the International Admissions and Enrollment Office and the Department of English Language Learners and Multilingual Education. And we're going to share some specifics today, starting with uh, international admissions and enrollment data so that we can take a look at that and see what that's looked like in our offices more recently. We're going to look at the intake process. Again, one conversation we've had over time, and they've been made many updates in which they'll be able to share what those updates are in the presentation today. And the vision of the Welcoming Center. That has been a priority in our budget. It has been one that we said we wanted to bring to fruition in Montgomery County, so we are going to share that with you today as well. Um, the team are also going to share, share um, enrollment data for the emergent multilingual learners in the system. We're going to talk about language, language proficiency and what that looks like in many of uh, our different buildings and highlight some of the work of students who have that limited or interrupted formal education. Um, and I'd like to share that we always like to bring the stories of the schools into our presentation. So we're going to hear some of how this has been um, formulated at Barnes Elementary School. And I'd like to thank Ms. Goddard for being here, principal at Watkins uh, Mill High School. And she will also be able to share as we spotlight, spotlight how we've had some coordinated efforts to support our EML students there at Watkins Mill. So I want to thank you ahead of time for being here at the table and being able to make that story one that translates into uh, a story in one of our high schools, Watkins Mill specifically. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Davis, to kick off this presentation. Thank you, Dr. McKnight, and for your support too of coming out to Rockin' Horse uh, and to really, to really share and see the work that we are doing day in and day out uh, for our students. Good afternoon. Again, thank you for having us back to the table. Again, uh, to President Wolf, to Vice President Sylvester, to members of the board, and again to Dr. McKnight. I am pleased to represent Student Family Support and Engagement. Uh, and I'm here along with several of my colleagues, Ms. Borkis, Mr. Alvarenga, as well as with colleagues in the curriculum office uh, who serve as steadfast partners for us around this work. And several of our school-based colleagues, as Dr. McKnight mentioned, who you will hear from later in the presentation. Although we have presented around this topic previously, we're excited to share several updates regarding international admissions and enrollment. Before we get too far into the presentation, I always like to set the context with a reminder that this work and charge directly align with our strategic plan in the area of well-being and family support. Also our DSIT, as well as several areas of PROSPER, such as putting our students first and supporting us, supporting our staff to meet the students' needs. This is paramount, particularly as we continue to support students and families who have been impacted by multiple hardships, such as those arriving from Afghanistan and Ukraine, just to name a few. Before I outline the presentation for today, I would like to circle back to a reflection that I shared back in the fall. It had to do with a conversation that I had prior to the start of the school year. Knowing that I serve MCPS and support international admissions and enrollment, 
I was speaking with a neighbor, and this particular neighbor asked me, how do you think, or what do you think, excuse me, will happen to MCPS with the influx of foreigners, as she called them. I was pleased to share that we embraced the opportunity that our system would have to continue to grow stronger by preparing all students, including our newcomers, to thrive in their future. This conversation resurfaced for me a couple of weeks back. I, I recall a conversation that we were having at the board table, I think it was on March the 8th, where there was discussion around mindset, discussing assets versus a deficit mindset, and how our emergent multilingual learners, or our EMLs, as you will hear further uh, as we progress through the presentation, belong to and are the responsibility of all of us. And I want to say that again, of all of us, not only to our EML staff. As our enrollment numbers grow from this past year, as, as indicated, as you will see in just a few moments, a one OTLS approach and beyond will be essential to meet the social, emotional, and academic needs of all of our newcomers, as well as to bring this work to scale. And we can go to the next, it looks like we're already on the next slide, so we can just stay right there. Uh, I know that Dr. McKnight has outlined for you what we will go through today uh, during our time together. So, so I don't want to be redundant there, but just so you can see the, the pieces of what we will speak to. Uh, and at this time, to keep us moving along, I will turn the presentation over to Ms. Borges, our Acting Director of Student Family uh, Services and also International Admissions and Enrollment. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, members of the board. I just want to uh, share how happy we were to have you visit uh, Rocking Horse. And after you left, my staff was just over the moon that you had visited and that they had had an opportunity to speak with you. So thank you for that. It is a pleasure to be here with you today to share our most recent enrollment and newcomer support updates. I want to start, sorry, next slide. I want to start by highlighting the total number of newcomers we have received and enrolled from all over the world since July 1st. As of March 15, we have enrolled over 3,300 newcomers, with the last 200 students enrolling this month alone. As of this morning, our total number is 3,473. As you can see, the highlighted portion of the graph shows what historically tends to be the busiest enrollment months of the year, July through October over the previous four years. However, this year, we can see that enrollment has continued at a steady pace throughout the school year. We continue to welcome between 100 and 150 new students each week at our Welcome Center at Rocking Horse. International enrollment has been severely impacted, not only by the pandemic, but also by a myriad of unfortunate socioeconomic and political circumstances experienced by so many. There is a huge need for additional staffing and resources to continue supporting the increased influx of newcomers with severe social, emotional, and basic needs. Next slide, please. Amongst many of the newcomer subgroups, we welcome to MCPS nearly 35% are the Office of Refugee Resettlement Children from Central America seeking asylum due to violence and political turmoil in their countries. In the last two months, we've seen an increase in the number of indigenous families coming from Guatemala. And we're collaborating with community organizations such as the International Mayan League to provide much needed professional learning opportunities for MCPS staff and support for these families. Next slide, please. We are proud to report that we have welcomed families from a wide variety of countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. The top six countries represented include El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Ethiopia, Peru, and Brazil. And some of our most recent arrivals are coming from Afghanistan and the Ukraine. Additionally, it is important to note that nearly 45% of the newcomer students were enrolled at the high school level this year. This trend has broad implications for proper scheduling and creating precise graduation plans that support high schools in their graduation rate goals. 
IAE is collaborating closely with high schools to support them in the proper awarding of credits and course scheduling. Next slide, please. SFSS is also collaborating with the Office of Technology and Innovation in the development and launching of an enrollment dashboard that can be shared publicly on our MCPS website. This dashboard will serve to keep everyone informed of enrollment trends throughout the year. The two graphs presented here show a weekly and monthly enrollment view for FY22. Other charts include information regarding the number of families who initiate the enrollment process and the number of students who qualify and get tested for ELD services. Next slide, please. Prior to April 2020, families were scheduled for in-person intake appointments, but during our virtual learning period, international families were limited to a virtual enrollment process that extended into the summer of 2021, consisting of four distinct and sequential phases. It was important to add a phase for the submission and review of documentation, given that families were not being seen in person. This phase was often lengthy and cumbersome because it was difficult to contact families and challenging for them to submit required documents. For this upcoming summer, 2022, we are working closely with our colleagues in OTI to launch the online registration process via Synergy, which will allow us to support international families in creating parent view accounts in order to enroll their children directly. We are planning to expand our welcome center to include multiple devices and a team of PCCs who will support newcomer parents every step of the way. This online registration process upgrade is only one of the many upgrades planned for the new Welcome Center. Our newcomer coordinator, Mr. Oscar Alvarenga, will now share more on our vision for the reimagined Welcome Center. Next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Borquez. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to say that while I've worked with many of you in the past wearing many different hats, I'm excited to be addressing you as a newcomer transition coordinator. My position is new, but the work is not, and I'm committed to helping MCPS support our students, family, and staff. I am proud to present our vision of our new Welcome Center. We are currently implementing significant, significant improvements at Rocking Horse. We are updating our enrollment process in preparation of the new online registration plan by including support stations in which we can move families efficiently through the enrollment process. Additionally, we have ESOL transition counselors, or ETCs, and parent community coordinators, or PCCs, on site to conduct need, needs assessments for our newcomer students and parents so we can better provide wraparound services and at intake. Lastly, we're enhancing our orientation program that begins at IAE at intake and continues through enrollment processes, process at schools and beyond. Newcomers will receive continuous support throughout the school year from key staff such as their counselor, ELD staff, ETCs, PCCs, PPWs, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Our office connects families to community partners such as DHHS, CASA, Identity, the Gilcrest Center, and others who provide much needed basic services such as enrollment in health insurance, housing support, legal service referrals, and much more. The Montgomery County Newcomer Initiative, Bienvenidos Aquí Para Ti, is a joint effort between Montgomery County government, Montgomery County public schools, and the community service providers, functioning as a true network to support our newcomers in our county. With Ta I have been working with Tani Alfaro, the newcomer coordinator with DHHS, to better coordinate services. We know that the success of our families is based on how soon we can help identify the need and the level of support that we can provide. We also know that our school staff is stretched and that, we, and that the needs are everywhere. Therefore, we continue to build and strengthen the resources and services available to them so they can turn, in turn help our students and families succeed. Next slide, please. In addition to supporting families at enrollment, our school-based SFSS staff continue to build their capacity and provide a myriad of services to students and families. We continue to hire additional staff to support schools. 
Our ETC supports social emotional health of our newcomer students at their schools via restorative circles and group therapy. We have hired eight additional ETCs this year and we have expanded services to a number of schools as well as countywide support. ETCs have completed uh, the newer sequential model in education and cultura cura training that are now being implemented at schools. ETCs also are also supporting responding to crisis in schools, providing trauma-informed training to staff and supporting newcomers who are experiencing a wide range of social emotional challenges. Our PCCs support all families, including newcomers, in a wide variety of ways. They are key collaborators in schools to enhance parent and community engagement. We have hired 15 additional PCCs this year and have expanded services to a number of schools as well as countywide support. PCCs have pr participated in professional development opportunities that build their capacity to support families. PCC support families uh, during important initiatives such as vaccination campaigns, enrollment efforts, parent, ac parent academy workshops, and many more. As a newcomer coordinator, I have been able to see all the hard work our staff is doing and how they go above and beyond to find solutions. It can be difficult to measure all the work that is being done on the ground, but as I speak with parents, I can hear how our staff is making a difference. I have been able to speak with principals about their work that the work that they're doing for our newcomers, but also acknowledging that we need to continue building bridges. Our principals are excited about the Bienvenidos initiative, and I'm excited to be part of this work. I'd like to pause our presentation at this moment and welcome Ms. Wolf and the board to open for discussion. Please turn your light on if you have any questions at this time. Ms. Harris. I didn't need to put my light on. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I've been out to Rocking Horse a couple times, silk purse sow's ear out there. Yeah, we have some work to do. Um, so just a quick question. Um, Mr. Alvarenga, you were talking about in depth the, the work of our parent community coordinators, our ESOL transition counselors, our PPWs. How are the language skills and capacity of that staff currently meeting the variety of language needs of the um, the diverse population of families that are coming to us now. And I know Mayan is, a, in the indigenous languages, are a, a struggle. I'll start and then I'll let Ms. Uh, Margarita, Ms. Borquez uh, continue. But uh, our, our staff is multilingual. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we're very proud of is that in the hiring process, we understand the, pro the, the students that we're serving mm -hmm. and making sure that they're able to communicate with them and their families is essential uh, of this work. Um, Ms. Borges has a little bit more detail in, in um, the languages that they all speak, but I do know that our staff is multilingual and is, is competent to work with the students that they're serving. Thank you, yes, um, like I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of hiring uh, many more ETC positions. It's been a little bit difficult and challenging to find multilingual, multicultural health professionals, but we keep searching and we keep um, working with our community partners to find them. Um, I'm actually holding interviews next week for five more ETC positions, and I'm happy to say that one of the candidates that we'll be interviewing speaks Farsi, which is wonderful, um, that it will definitely address some of the students that are coming to us now. Um, we are just now getting families from the Ukraine, but we're actively seeking uh, PCCs and ETCs that are multilingual and multicultural. Uh, the other thing I'd like to share is that we're in the process of um, a reclassification study for our ETCs because we need to be more competitive in our salaries. Um, one of the other uh, challenges that we're facing is not only finding multilingual, multicultural mental health professionals, but for us to have the competitive salaries that will actually attract these um, professionals and maintain them. So we're um, hoping for a good outcome there as well. I was on before, my apologies. I was just gonna add, if I may, uh, the importance I also heard in your question about PPWs as well. So we look at that as one SFSC, not just 
clearly with our, our uh, student family and school services staff and national admissions, but also for our bilingual PPW, psychologists. I wanted to bring to the board also, we have a mental health coordinator who's been with us for a little bit who is a Spanish speaker. So just in thinking about that more broadly, I just wanted to, to elevate that piece too in the work that we do collectively as a team. Yeah, and I would just add, uh, to me, um, the work that we're trying to do to grow our own we need this, these linguistically and culturally diverse staff. We already have that in our student population, and the more that we can be reaching out to our current and recent graduates um, about thinking about coming back to us as, a, as an ETC, you know, as a, a parent community coordinator, um, you know, we, there are challenges with finding people with that skill set, but we are lucky to have a 160,000 students that many of whom would meet those requirements and I don't know how many of our students actually think about that when we talk about grow your own everybody just thinks teachers but um, I don't know if we were reaching out to our very diverse population of talented students and asking them to come in and support that work Miss Silvestri yeah I wanted to um understand the funding mechanisms here. Um, we have 3,000 plus students since July, but the cutoff for our enrollment numbers is in September. And therefore, am I understanding this correctly that we don't get a per pupil allocation for the remaining 2,000 plus because they enrolled after September? That is correct, uh, Ms. Silvestri. So what we do is we've had experiences with international enrollment over time and we look at the trends in terms of where those families tend to enroll. And so we take that into consideration when we plan out staffing. Um, this year we knew that we expected our international enrollment to grow. We knew that and we went back and looked at lessons from 2017 um, and were able to identify what are the specific schools and spaces that we need to have padding and staffing to support that. And I must say this year, um, because we were able to keep our staffing in place uh, as a result of not reducing staffing because of the pandemic, many of our schools were already prepared from a staffing level to address that need. But is there, is there a conversation that we should be having with the state recognizing that this is the new normal where we're getting, and we're not the only school system in the Maryland mm -hmm. that's getting newcomers throughout the year. So September, okay, I get it. You have to cut it off at some point, but you, this is, 2,000 more students have come since September. That's a significant uh, number. That's a new. That's Absolutely. another high school. So, it, can we have that conversation with our, with the powers that be? Absolutely. Uh, very great perspective in terms of while in Montgomery County Public Schools we were prepared this year because we knew what was coming and we know what we needed to do with staffing. We do need to think about moving forward how it is not an event that we planned for, but it is a part of the the normal, uh, normal process. So um, absolutely, as we look at all of these processes, quite frankly, MOE, MOE and how we're funded and as well as when we cut off enrollment, and that's really important to us as a, a community that's very transit and, and mobile. So that is absolutely advocacy that we will continue to participate on. And we've actually started many of those conversations as myself and other superintendents around the state have said, you know, there are things that we're learning about what's regular business and no longer an event that we want some of those regulations to be in consideration of, and this is one. Um, and while I'm speaking to this, I did want to circle back to Ms. Harris. Um, absolutely, we are engaging our students who are in our buildings right now, knowing that they are a big part of uh, our population who desire and care very much about the school system and desire to work in it. Fascinating, earlier uh, Ms. Aluni and I were having that conversation because after our student leadership session last night, I was talking to many of our students and they're saying, we want to come back and work in MCPS <laughs> um, and making that commitment. So we are all engaging in those discussions and actually um, engaging with them to find out what some of their areas of interest are and we'll continue to nurture that while they are away in their four-year institutions so that they know that we are staying connected with them to ensure that they come back. Because I think our community represents the diversity that we want to see in our school system. This is their home. We want to welcome them back home after they've received all of that education. And we see that as a primary benefit to us um, engaging in that way. So thank you for that question because it is definitely a priority of ours. Um, some quick questions here. Um, welcome Center, the new Welcome Center, where is it going to be and 
by when can we expect to do a tour of that location? So I can I can start off and then I can ask Mr. Alrenga and Ms. Borkes to add. Uh, we are working right now to continue our services at Rocking Horse uh, with, with eventual have an opportunity for us to move uh, into another facility but uh, for the upcoming year we will be at Rocking Horse. Uh, we've been working very closely just to give you updates with our partners and facilities uh, who have provided us, uh, uh, Ms. Borkes can share, uh, some, some upgrades that we will make it to so in, to ensure that it is a welcoming center as the name implies for our not just for our students, but for our families. So furniture, for example, do we have spaces for our children when they come in? It should be a place that really is our first step, uh, uh, putting our best foot forward, first step into the system, and it should look that way. So again, I, I give kudos to Ms. Borkes and also to our, our colleagues in uh, facilities who are helping us to do the upgrades. Uh, starting, uh, I believe immediately, she can share more about the timeline, but I know between now and I believe it's May, uh, that we have really looked at what are some of the specific upgrades we can make to our site at Rocking Horse. So it's still top secret where we're moving the Welcome Center. <laughs> <laughs> and, the t and when will I, we be at the new Welcome Center is my question. I know you're making so upgrades to Rocking Horse now, but... That yes. is. Is that it? Yeah, if I could, I could just jump in there, for Mr. Vestry. So um, when we think about our CIP budget and some of the adjustments that we have to make there, this is a part of what we ultimately want to do because just like as we build the facilities for our students as new schools, we want this welcoming center to be state of the art. People, personnel, technology, and all of those pieces. And so it's, we would be happy to move into that next year, but we're also looking at some facilities that are requiring transition of current office space to new office space so that we can then use space that's available to enhance the welcoming center. So um, we are looking at it within the next couple of years. That's why we made the commitment to say what are the enhancements that we want to make in what we have right now because we don't want to cut ourselves short or the families short in terms of providing the state of art facility that we have. So we so it's the transition that comes into the office space that we desired or the building space that we desire to have for that and thinking of how um, we need to vacate some of that okay. space no, that, That's helpful just to manage expectations, I think. We're, Absolutely. So. Thank you. Um, in terms of the intake process, in layman's terms, what has changed and improved? So currently we are working with um, community navigators. We are collaborating with CASA who are in the Welcome Center with us to help with start the enrollment process but also connect them to much needed services right on the spot. Um, we are looking forward to the online registration process that will launch next week on the 28th. And so we're looking to revamp how we're going to help families open parent view accounts and support them on the spot with devices to help them enroll their children and help them upload documents. Uh, we continue to expedite the process that we have right now to make sure that families are feeling supported and they can always come into the Welcome Center in person to get support from our parent community coordinators. And uh, ideally, well, what, what would be the average time for this process to um, take place? Because, of course, we want to get students into schools as soon as possible. Absolutely. Right now, if a family uh, presents with all of the documents required, we can process them within three or four days. Um, when we launch the online registration process, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve as we help families open their parent view accounts. We, we foresee that there will be parents who can just open their accounts on their phone and be able to do most of the process on their own, but we're also prepared for the families who are going to need a lot more support, especially those who don't speak English and can't navigate the technology, so that we can help them on site with parent community coordinators and devices that we will be offering to help them uh, with the enrollment process. Now, I think that's important for our partners to understand and the public to understand mm -hmm. is when we hear these stories of, oh, it's taken six weeks for my child to enroll, it's largely because we're missing some documents mm -hmm. that, oh, mm -hmm. but there's got to be a, a, an in-between, right? Because we don't want children to be out of school mm -hmm. for six weeks, even if they're having a hard time um, getting that document. But And I know 
Every time I send a case to you, you find a way to <laughs> make it work. Absolutely. But th we hear a lot, what the board hears every year from families from all over the world, frankly. Mm -hmm. It's taking too long, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that this new intake process will help um, these um, challenges. That It's a challenging process, but the more that we can do to make it smoother, the better. My final question is, um, of the 3,000 plus students since, ja since July, how many students have stopped attending MCPS? Um, do we know where what happened to them and uh, what I'm guessing that our well-being teams were involved in trying to keep them with us, but if you just could um, share some information about that. Um, yes, we are tracking uh, a lot of that data, and we're going to be working very closely with our partners in OTI to develop um, reports that we can generate through Synergy. We want to be able to have a marker to track all of the students that are enrolling through IAE so we can follow them uh, throughout their time in school. And of course, I'm collaborating very closely with Dr. Jennifer Norton um, on tracking these students. Since January, we um, have seen only 12 that have um, not are no longer enrolled, but we need to disaggregate that data and find out why. Um, many of our newcomers are pretty transient. Some of them enroll and then later enroll in PG County or move to New York. So we want to make sure that we're finding out exactly why they're not enrolling, um, they're withdrawing and how we can support that. We're also elevating the student well-being teams, the structure that already exists in schools, who are monitoring all of their students and keeping track of attendance and grades that may be plummeting. And um, our PPWs, our PCCs, and ETCs are part of those teams, and they're supporting those students. What does the state, how does the state count those 12 students? Are those considered dropouts? It depends on the withdrawal code. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A question. You indicated that 45% of them are going directly into the high school. What kind of support are we able to provide at that level to ensure that they stay there and successfully finish? And how long is that, you know, do you have any indication about how long that is taking? How much extra time they might need? to support the students at the high school level. Um, so one of the things that we do um, in my office to get them started on the right foot is to make sure that we are reviewing all of their international transcripts in a timely fashion as much as they can um, submit documentation, especially during the pandemic. It has been challenging for many families to submit official transcripts. But once we uh, obtain them, we uh, complete credit evaluations as quickly as we can and send them to schools. And then I, uh, we have an instructional specialist who supports and reaches out to schools to help um, guidance counselors or counseling teams, anybody in the school who needs support to build a graduation plan for these students. So we make sure that they're getting the credits that they need to start and to be scheduled correctly um, and to have a graduation plan so that they're not repeating courses or missing courses that are needed for graduation. And then we have the ETCs, PCCs, PPWs, counselors um, who are supporting the students internally and monitoring them and making sure that they're um, following how they're succeeding in their courses. Okay, thank you. Am I seeing any other questions? I had one follow-up. Yeah, I had one quick follow-up to um, Ms. Silvestri's questions about the Welcome Center. And I, I'm pretty sure based on this, that um, the vision is that all of these community partners will actually be on site so that it's a one-stop shop for our families to get any kind of services and supports in the county, or at least that first touch. Yes, that is our, our dream, <coughs> is to have our community partners on site with us. And we've actually moved in that direction already. We have Celia Ortiz from the Primary Care Coalition who works on site with us to enroll all of our students in Care for Kids, those who qualify. We also have CASA um, navigators on site with us in the Welcome Center who are uh, doing uh, initial needs assessments to see what the families are needing and connecting them to those resources right away. And we hope to invite the Gilchrist Center again uh, so that we can connect them to much needed legal services as well. And. Um 
just in the as the vision unfolds and the planning mm -hmm. unfolds, will we be partnering with this group of service providers to design the space so that we ensure that we have the type some of these services require different kinds of space? Yeah. That we have everything that would be required for them to s effectively deliver the, the resources and the services. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think many of you remember when I presented uh, a few months ago, we have a steering committee, a newcomer steering committee that started back in April with the funding we received from the county. And we have several subgroups in that steering committee uh, that Oscar and I are both part of. We attend many of the subgroups as well. But we have a legal services subgroup. We have a, an education subcommittee that um, we co-chair. But many of the community partners are meeting on a regular basis, and we meet monthly to discuss how we're going to coordinate our efforts and how we are going to align our processes so that we are uh, complementing each other. Yeah, it, that's amazing. Thank you. Of course. Ms. O'Looney. Yes, I know uh, you mentioned to Ms. Wolf that we have PPWs and counselors supporting individual students. Are we tracking? Um, newcomer students as a whole for any trends and how long it's taking them to graduate, what courses they might struggle with so we know where to best place our resources in supporting them? Um, yes, we're definitely looking at that and tracking them as a group. And I don't want to steal uh, Dr. Norton's thunder, but she will be speaking more to that uh, momentarily. OK, thank you. You want to continue? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Norton, we'll turn it over to you to begin. Okay. Good afternoon, President Wolf, Superintendent McKnight, and members of the board. My name is Jennifer Norton, and I serve as director for the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. I am joined today by Ms. Carol Goddard, principal at Watkins Mill High School, Ms. Sandra Blutner, Supervisor for Secondary English Language Development, and Tamara Hewlett, super, Supervisor for Elementary English Language Development. I am pleased to be here with you today to share an update on the department's work and collaboration um, with schools to serve students who are newly enrolled, who are adding English to their linguistic repertoire, with a focus on those students who have limited and or interrupted formal education also known as SLIFE. I also want to acknowledge the interconnectedness of our work um, with the, our partners in the Office of Student and Family Support and Engagement, which will you, see illustrate, you will see illustrated as we continue our presentation. Um, I also want to say we are so proud of the amazing students we serve and the incredible work that they do as MCPS students. So today you will, um, we will share two videos um, in which you will hear from two students about their experiences, as well as a SLIFE coach, teacher, resource teacher, instructional specialist, counselor, principal, assistant principal, and parent community coordinator, and the work that they um, do to support students in a collaborative and growth-oriented manner. Um, before we get to those main events, um, I will provide some brief updates. Next slide. 
Um, first, as you saw at the March 8th board meeting, we are updating our language around multilingualism. We are shifting to new terminology, demonstrating that we value students' multilingual and multicultural assets. Um, this language is used in the Board of Education's non-discrimination, equity, and cultural proficiency policy, and we are using it instructionally as well. Um, we use emergent multilingual learner, known as English learner under ESSA, uh, to recognize that students are in the process of adding English um, to their linguistic repertoire and are becoming bilingual or many times multilingual. Um, you will also see us using um, English Language Development, or ELD, instead of ESOL, um, when describing the programs and services um, that emergent multilingual learners receive. English language development is used in COMAR 13A to describe programming for students who are emergent multilingual learners. And we are excited to use these assets-based terms to demonstrate our values. Um, on the next slide, I will share en enrollment updates. Okay. So as you know, the overall number of students who are emergent multilingual learners has increased this year um, with a total of 29,992 students overall. About half are currently in the beginning stages of adding English to their linguistic repertoire, um, shown here in levels, uh, English language proficiency levels one and two. Next slide. This slide zeroes in on the students who, ha who have been enrolled through IAE and have been identified as eligible for English language development services. So as you can see, MCPS continues to welcome new emergent multilingual students at a steady rate. By the end of the first marking period, nearly 1,000 students were newly identified as emergent multilingual learners. Of these, 128 were identified as having limited or interrupted formal education, also refers to as SLIFE, and are receiving additional supports to accelerate their learning. The number of newly enrolled emergent multilingual learners nearly doubled from the end of marking period one to the end of marking period two, with the biggest jumps um, seen at the high school level. Even in the past month, the numbers of newly enrolled students who are emergent multilingual learners has increased by 300, um, now totaling over 2,000. Of these, 332 students who are newly enrolled have been identified as SLIFE. MCPS tracks students' enrollment status, um, to refer to your question from earlier. If a student unenrolls, schools enter leave codes depending on the reason of the withdrawal. Um, so counselors and student well-being teams coordinate, of course, to prevent um, students from disengaging in school. And you know, we also recognize that students who have newly immigrated to the US are in a time of change and flux um, and maybe changing residences as they settle in Montgomery County or in the surrounding area. Um, but as of January 26, um, we had that 14 students had unenrolled. Um, of those, two transferred outside of Montgomery County, three transferred to another state or US territory, seven transferred to a school of a foreign country, and um, one student from high school and one student from CREA um, were whereabouts unknown. So no knowledge of where they went or why. Um, we know that schools and central office also monitor attendance and that attendance has been a challenge um, during the COVID surge this winter. Um, so unfortunately, you know, in looking at the data, we did see higher rates of absence across the year for emergent multilingual learner students um, in secondary, um, just a disproportionate um, rate of absence, um, and you know that's one of the things that we will be coordinating with our partners in SFSS to look into this by school and identify ways that we can help support um, and coordinate on that. Um, in the sections that follow, um, you will learn more about the services and supports for our students who are SLIFE at the elementary and secondary levels. Um, first, I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Tamara Hewlett, to talk about elementary supports. Next slide. Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Hewlett, and I am the English Language Development Supervisor at the elementary level. As Dr. Norton outlined, the system has welcomed a lot of newcomers this year in the, in the, into the district. 
a subset of those students have been at the elementary level and they come to us with limited or interrupted formal education. These students truly deserve champions who believe in their learning and the assets they bring to schools every day. In previous years, students with limited or interrupted formal education at the elementary level were instructed at three sites around the district and were enrolled in the elementary multidisciplinary education training and support program, also known as METS. The students were served by an English language development teacher throughout their day in, uh, for both language and content instruction. In the fall of 2019, when we saw an increase in enrollment of students with uh, this specific profile, we had to put a pause on enrolling students at these three sites as the sites were full and could not accommodate more students. As a result, SLIFE students started going to their home schools and uh, they were, so the home schools were supported by the English Language Development Central Office team. As a result, a study was conducted by the Office of Shared Accountability and the study's results were released in December of 2020. It was determined that a shift in the way that we provided services as a district for these particular students was necessary. The findings revealed that students that attended their home schools and that had access to grade level instruction, language models, and specific targeted language and, and content instruction performed at higher rates than the students that attended the MET sites with a teacher needing to serve three grade levels of students in one classroom. With these results, the decision was made to have SLIFE students attend their home schools starting this school year, 2021-2022, and put an end to the elementary METS program. Knowing that this model would require additional supports, and with the expected increases uh, at, of elementary SLIFE, the elementary SLIFE coach position was created. This position would not have been made possible without the specific investment made by the County Council in the summer of 2021 to fund six SLIFE coach positions for FY22, um, this school year. Uh, the work that the SLIFE coaches are doing aligns with the MCPS strategic priority area number one, academic excellence. As we look at what it means to provide access to opportunity and rigorous coursework, the SLIFE coaches are pivotal in working with schools to ensure the curriculum and instruction, professional development, and collaboration consistently happens on behalf of the students they serve. We currently have three SLIFE coaches serving in this capacity, and we will have six coaches for next school year. It is with great pride that I spend a uh, special shout out, send one, they're, they're over there, uh, to our three coaches who are in the audience today, Ms. Alyssa Casey, Ms. Michelle Brooks, and Ms. Katie Lazo. Next slide, please. Today we are providing a glimpse into the work of this life coach and the impact that the specialized support has had on students, staff, and schools. We have, ha we have the pleasure of introducing the team of Lucy Barnsley Elementary School, a school where Ms. Katie Lazo and one of our SLIFE coaches has been providing support. I do also want to give a shout out to the Lucy Barnsley team who's in the audience also. <laughs> Principal Trofkin is in the audience. Classroom teacher Hannah Glazer is in the audience as well. Uh, we have Ms. Elena Morozova who's in the virtual audience. And Ms. Katie Lazo, uh, they'll be all featured in the video. And stu a student who just melts my heart, Larry. Larry, if you're watching, hi. Um, and so we, wa we just want to um, give you a glimpse into the work that they're doing and the impact that this life coach is having on student success. Could I ask a quick, quick clarification question? Again, SLIFE is interrupted S students. education mm -hmm. with two years of not being in school. Yes, in MCPS, uh, two or more years of limited or interrupted formal education is how we identify students. Thank you. Yes. A 
homeless life student is a student who has missed two or more years of school in their home country and are operating two or more levels below grade level. Came back in the house. Came back in the house. When I first met Larry, he was a, a rather shy young man who did not volunteer any information or any verbal responses even. At the beginning of the year, I felt quite unsure of what to expect and what Larry would need to be successful in third grade. Our students have missed school for a reason, whether or not that their family needed to move, maybe there was some economic reason to come from their country here. I have heard teachers share with me they're not exactly sure what to do. They want to help them, but they don't feel like they can, when actually we can. Miss Lazo was really helpful in demonstrating strategies that would be helpful for Larry to encourage him to participate in learning every day. When a student with interrupted education in particular comes in, it becomes necessary to create a school community, a network really, to support that child. So in order to deliver content to our students, they need language. And often when we first meet them, they don't have that. But they come to the classroom with a great deal of assets, of experiences that we need to tap into. The specialization really starts with getting to know who that person is. And my hand. <laughs> I think the welcome part is key. All students should be able to attend their home school, and a big reason for that is community. If they feel like they are wanted or belong there, they are going to relax. And actually, we're programmed to learn language through interaction. That's the most authentic learning you can have. Can you help me to write the word picnic? I think it's a gift that we have uh, access to a life coach who brings in not only her expertise and years of experience, but also opportunities for professional development for all of us who are on this team. I think one of the unique benefits of this LIFE program, I actually feel very honored and privileged to be part of this program because I feel the professional development that has come with the program has been invaluable to all of my staff. Her expertise and her understanding of SLIFE students' needs has been a huge asset. Having Katie in the classroom also allows me as a teacher to learn new techniques and strategies to keep in my toolbox in years to come. Como se dice in English? Um, nice! I think it's also really important as a SLIFE coach is um, you're a teacher just like them, right? We stand alongside them and we're in the work together. I think the fact that Larry is very happy at school is something that we all work together on and the fact that he feels supported with Miss Lazo coming into the classroom and he feels comfortable exploring new ways to learn. Larry has made so much growth this year. He's just so enthusiastic about learning. In the school I feel good. Tengo amigos y cuando vine la primera vez a la escuela te, era muy tímido. En tercer grado he aprendido muchas cosas. Puedo hablar en inglés, hacer oraciones, con tal de unos tres mil me dan también allá aquí en la escuela. Thank you. I'll now pass it on to Miss Sandra Bluetner. Good evening, um, Dr. McKnight, um, Dr. Mrs. Wolf, and members of the board. It's an absolute pleasure to be here again with you to talk about what's happening at the secondary school level. And we're really excited about some of the work that's been happening. As you've heard, there are a lot of changes that we've seen. A lot of students have come to the secondary level. At the um, middle school level, we know we have about 4,661 students that are emergent multilingual learners, so a significant number. And at high school, we have over 6,000 students that are at that level that need supports. I, as we were having conversations today, I heard lots of questions about what do those supports look like? And I think we've heard about the social and emotional supports that are in place. And just know that those instructional supports are also in place because we know our students need to be successful. And we also know how important it is for collaboration, 
to be in place, for equity to be in place for our students um, so that they can be successful. If you could go back a slide. Great, I see our slides have come back up. Um, I wanted to just highlight for you a couple of things that you should be aware of. You heard Ms. Hewlett speak to the fact that the METS program has shifted at the elementary level, especially when we consider that they're elementary students. I know that they're putting those supports in place have been very helpful. Some of the things that we've known about our students at the secondary level is that they do need those additional supports. We have 10 MET sites at the middle school level, and we have 12 MET sites at the high school level. And just to give you a sense of how many students are in these sites, we have 105 emergent multilingual learners that are at our middle, 10 middle school sites and about 408 at our high school sites. So they are in, at these sites receiving supports. We know that there are lots of things that they need to support literacy and mathematics because that academic load of what they need to be able to do to meet grade level standards is significant. And so with those supports in place, we're making sure that they have the supports that they need to, to learn language, to learn the mathematics conceptual knowledge, skills, and processes so they can actually meet grade level standard as well as literacy. So that is our ongoing work. As you can see, you, we mentioned that there are data monitoring meetings. These are very important ways that we are working closely with school staff. We meet with them to talk about how students are progressing language-wise, literacy-wise, mathematics. And we also have with us our SFSS um, partners who are parent community coordinators or ESOL transition counselors that are with us so that we're able to monitor and see what supports are needed. So it is a very coordinated effort to really ensure that we're supporting the needs of our students. And I know it's led by uh, the work of our schools. Um, I also wanted to just highlight for you our exit criteria. We're really making sure that, yes, we're providing the professional development. Yes, we're making sure that our students have access to grade level courses. And when they are not there yet, we make sure they have those supports. But we're also monitoring to ensure that students do not stay in a program that might feel isolated for too long. So that means that we're really monitoring so that by the end of two years, and when I say two years, keep in mind that not all students are in the program for two years. Some students only need math support. Other students need literacy. So they're in for whatever supports they need, but we really try to make sure that they're not in that program for too long. Additionally, we're looking at when they reach higher levels of proficiency, they do not need to continue in the program. So that's really important as well. We want our students to have access because as we think about those big ideas um, and the philosophy of WIDA, which is the consortium we're part of, we know that equity is important, collaboration is critical, and the integration of language and content also is important. Next slide, please. So I know that some of you have seen this information about the rise in graduation rates, and I just wanted to take a moment to highlight here for you some of the growth that we've seen over time. We now are at 67.43, that is our four-year um, graduation cohort rate for our emergent multilingual learners. And so that is a huge growth that has happened. Now we always want to get to 100%, so we know that we're not there yet, but we are moving along. And I wanted you to see that when you look at that light blue bar, that is all students. Um, the dark blue would be our emergent multilingual learners um, for in the four-year cohort. And then the orange is in the five-year cohort. So you can see that we don't quite have that for FY 2021 yet, what that five-year cohort is, but we are making progress. And I really wanted to underscore the work that has been done. It is a collaborative effort, a lot of work done by our school staff. I know that over um, many years, a couple of years, Mrs. Rochelle Rubin was leading the work around graduation innovation and what needed to happen to make sure that we're really monitoring our students closely. We've been working closely with our partners with counselors to make sure that we're really looking at how our students moving along that pathway to our four year as many as possible so that we have very few students in that five year cohort. And so that has been a lot of ongoing work. 
we also have done a lot of work together as a team to ensure that the curriculum resources are aligned to grade level standard to really make sure that scheduling is appropriate for students and that we're communicating with a variety of stakeholders like our counselors, with our assistant principals, with our resource teachers and content specialists. So these are some of the things that we're doing to really make a difference for our students. Um, next slide, please. So um, you've heard a lot from us, and I really wanted to make, take a moment to underscore some of the incredible work that is happening at one of our high schools. Um, they have been doing a lot of work to address the instructional needs of students, the social emotional needs. And I know that um, our principal who's here with us today, um, Mrs. Goddard, has been really working with staff to ensure that students feel supported as they're welcomed into the school. So I want to take a moment now to turn it over to um, Ms. Goddard. Thank you for that. Sorry, thank you. Good evening, Ms. Uh, Wolf and Dr. McKnight and members of the board. I am pleased to be here today to share some highlights of the incredible work that our, our team is doing around supporting our EMLs. We do have in the audience some of the support people are uh, Heather Holcomb, ELD school, where is it, resource teacher. We have Ms. Fetzer Munoz, school-based ELD, and then we have Ms. Woods, our ELD parent community coordinator, and uh, is Ms. Mackin here? Not here, not here. Not here, okay. All right. Incredible team. I thank all of you for the hard work that you do. Just so you know, Watkins Mill is definitely a de destination location. I think Dr. Docker knows that, right? <laughs> you betcha. So we, we support our, our young arrivals in three important ways. One is we acclimate them to the school environment. Two, we get them, we get them to reach out and find their peers. We show them how to find their peers. And more importantly, we let them know that they are an extremely important part of our school community. We at Watkins Mill are 60% Hispanic, 23% uh, African American, 10% Asian, 5% white, and 2% multi-race. 50% of our students have had ESOL services during their academic years. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. All right, as most of you know, Watkinsville High School is an international baccalaureate world school. We offer the IB IB uh, DP, which is a diploma program. We offer the IB uh, career program, and we also have the middle years program. We also are pleased to have several academies, engineering, computer science, medical careers, hospitality and tourism, and we also have child development. Now, there are no barriers to these courses and or pathways for our students even our EMLs. We have, if you'll take a look at the pie chart, our population of EMLs are at 29.4%. 17% of those are ELP level one and two, and 12.4% are level ELP level three and four. We have 474 EMLs out of 1,622 students. 63 of those EML students are, have limited or interrupted education, so they are enrolled in our METS program. We're, the entire team works closely together to support all of our EML learners, so it's just not the METS, it's not those, just those newcomers, so like I said, we have the levels one, two, threes, and fours. We wrap around them, we focus on the newcomers, a, a lot on the newcomers because uh, we need to provide the instruction and the coordinated supports. We are extremely lucky to have a parent community coordinator in Ms. Woods and our school-based ELD counselor who provides a lot of support to our EL, e, EML families and their guardians. All right. So we do have a video for you. 
Uh, you will see some of the great uh, work that we do as you watch this video. Please bring the video up. MCPS is a diverse community of students from more than 150 countries who speak over 150 languages. Those numbers continue to rise as we welcome newly enrolled international admission students, also known as newcomers, planning in collaboration to create high-level instruction and wraparound supports for newcomers is a top priority in our schools countywide, including Watkins Mill High School. First and foremost, our goal is to make sure that our newcomers feel welcomed. As they transition to our school, we make sure that we provide them with a newcomer orientation where we assess their needs and we provide them with backpacks and school materials as needed. As well, we give them a tour of the school so they understand where their classes are and where their teachers are located. Many of our staff members are multilingual, and as many of our ESOL students, Spanish is their first language. This is very helpful in helping them become acclimated to, you know, the education in the United States and helping them succeed in their courses. A typical newcomer schedule includes some classes with the general student population and some sheltered classes with just their fellow newcomers and emergent multilingual learners. All courses still follow the standard MCPS curriculum. Me dirijo así mi primera clase, que es de matemáticas, donde hay una maestra que habla español, que por si algo, si yo no entiendo algo, ella me lo puede explicar. This is the student-facing material. I know it's not the same. School-based staff members partner with the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education to implement data-driven strategies that help newcomer students succeed. Our role is to develop curriculum and instructional programming resources and assessments. Here at Watkins Mill and at 22 other sites, we're looking at student progress, particularly the test scores, how they're doing social emotionally and behaviorally, and we're monitoring this closely with our school community. Newcomer support doesn't just end with students. Families have a key role in their child's education too, so parent community coordinators offer vital resources to newcomer families. And that could be food, um, coats, whatever the family or the newcomers that are coming, then we're ready to support them and guide them through our Montgomery County uh, school system. So, hoy día, ¿qué es lo que necesita el apoyo mío? Eso era solo para llenar una aplicación. Central office and school-based staff at Watkins Mill and throughout the county are fully committed to these initiatives. Each of these supports works hand-in-hand -hand to create an environment where newcomers feel welcome and respected. Me siento feliz en Watkins Mill y apoyado porque siempre la clase que yo vaya hay algún maestro que habla español y yo sé que esto me servirá futuro porque pienso ir a la universidad y estudiar medicina y algún día llegar a poder ser doctor. MCPS is committed to providing a high quality education that will prepare all students of every race and culture for college or career. Exactamente. All right, we now turn it over to the board for discussion. Thank you. Very impressive what's going on there. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Ms. Harris? Um, yes, thank you. I um, have a couple questions, and I'm trying to um, assimilate slides 14 and 15 and make sense of the numbers. Um, and maybe I'm just not understanding some of the acronym, acronyms still working on that. Um, but in slide 14, we're talking about, it says total EML enrollments, and we're looking at, uh, you know, tw almost 30,000. And then in slide 14, it's talking also about number of EML and students with limited or interrupted formal education slide. So I'm not understanding how the subset of almost 30,000 on slide 14 is translating to the group of 2,200 on slide 15. Sure, so slide 14 shows our total enrollment of students who are emergent multilingual learners, including students who have been in Montgomery County Public Schools previous years. Okay. So it's 30,000. Yep. Um, the next slide 
shows it's really zeroing in on the students who have come through IEE this past school year. Um, and we've been focused on looking at these data, um, coordinating on the supports for those students who are newly enrolled, and specifically for the students who have been identified as SLIFE. Um, that we have this system for, you know, getting the flag from IAE, our team learns about it, and then the, puts the wheels in motion to have a SLIFE coach assigned or have a um, student go to their MET site and have that coordination start to occur. Okay. So this is focusing only on those newly enrolled students. Um, later, you saw some numbers from Sanja that show um, all of the students who have been identified as SLIFE, including the students from the previous year, because they do stay in that program for up to 24 months. So yeah, I can see how there's all these different ways to, to slice and look at. And so when we look at slide 15, so when you have your, EM, your EML, here we're differentiating emergent multilingual learners. And so if you're just EML, you don't have that interrupted education. That's it's right. It's just the SLIFE students that we're saying you've got at least two years of, mm -hmm. of missing interrupted education. Okay. That's right. And so when we're looking at these numbers then, are we able, are we saying that we are delivering this level of intensive services that were showed in the videos to all of the 100, well, I guess now it's 332 students in this system. Right, so the examples that you saw for elementary and for secondary, those are, you know, snapshots from specific schools, but these are the models that are used at the schools where students um, who have been identified as SLIFE are enrolled. And um, just wondering, um, when we're looking at how these students are doing, how we're checking on them, both academically and personally, mm -hmm. um, how are we just routinely, and I, I, I guess I'm in my mind, I'm trying to figure out looking at this level of intensive services. Um, and when you have students coming in, maybe you have students that actually started at the very, on the first day of school, and then in that same math class, you now have students who just arrived last week. And how is that instructor, or is that instructor expected to get all of those students to the same finish line by the last day of school? Yeah. I'm Stu asking that as a former teacher. Yes, no, that's <laughs> definitely a lot, and I think that's something that we would understand, that schools are really doing their best to welcome students throughout the school year, but that it is challenging to um, sort of bring a student in, find out where is the student at this moment, and then how do I make sure that my instruction um, and getting to know the student is going to really meet the student and then help bring them forward. So I think the, the answers will be different depending on the model. So I'll turn over to tomorrow for the elementary um, discussion. At the elementary level, our SIFE coaches really have their pulse on our students. Uh, we have 51 uh, students that we are currently serving um, from our SIFE coaches and one in the pipeline. We um, you know, have the system in place where we get in touch. Uh, IAE gives, gives us a heads up that someone's being screened, and so we start looking at who's going to take that student on. Uh, we make contact with the school. The life coach goes out, uh, meets with uh, the principal, meets with the classroom teacher, etc., and then we figure out specifically what that particular student needs because they don't all need the same thing. Um, they might be uh, proficient in math, but not necessarily proficient in uh, reading language arts. Um, they might have first language literacy skills. Um, some, uh, which we can use that to leverage to build uh, on to, you know, transition them to um, learning in, in English while still honoring the language that they speak. So every, every child is different um, and the SLIFE coaches really go out and um, get to meet the students, work with the classroom teachers. The reality is this life coach is not there every day. They have a caseload um, uh, that, that requires them to travel to, to many schools. So with the professional learning that we offer to classroom teachers, ELD teachers, math content coaches, reading specialists, it's really about building the capacity of the school so that they can, um, you know, have a hands-on uh, approach for the students. 
and um, alongside this life coach when they come there so they can model, you know, they do anything from model lessons to planning with uh, classroom teachers, um, identifying targeted supports. Uh, we have some interventions that are in place that are specific to SLIFE students. Um, and so the SLIFE coach is continuously looking at that data. Um, we are, uh, you know, basically trying to build up their foundational skills in order to create a bridge while still having class, having them have access to, to classroom grade level instruction. If we remo remove the classroom grade level instruction, they will continue to fall behind. So we need them immersed in content of the grade level and we need a bridge built for them because that's what they need. And so between our professional learning opportunities and the work that this life coach does, uh, these, that's you know, kind of the model that we have at the elementary level with continuous uh, data, data um, checking. Okay, and at the secondary level, just to add on to that picture, um, I think Mrs. Hewlett spoke to the fact that we do need to, def we need to individualize the program based on the needs of students. One of the things that we've done over time is we were using a variety of different programs, but as we shifted to ESSA and we looked at the results we were getting from with student performance, we realized how important it was to make sure whatever we were using was an evidence-based um, intervention resource, so it's the one that has been approved by the district, and then we provide supports, professional development, and we also make sure that as the students come in, because you talked about the fact that they might come in and they're all different places, we make sure that we have a program that is adaptive. So we're using System 44 for literacy, we're using Math 180, so it could be there are different blocks in the Math 180 program, so depending on what the student's needs are when they take the assessment, there's a placement assessment, they're then placed in the correct places. There are, it's a blended learning approach, so the teacher does do direct instruction, but there's also additional um, interaction for students. So all of that's really important so that we can make sure that the students are getting their learning needs met. And then there's that monitoring and additional support that happens with, from the resource teachers and the content specialists that are in the school. So we make sure we work with them. There's also coaching and supports that are available for teachers. So it's really that coordinated effort to make sure we're addressing the needs of both the teachers that are working with students as well as the students based on where they are. Yeah. Um I, and I'll just say, and I have to revert back to old language, old acronyms now, sorry. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm interested in learning a lot more about very directly is how we are objectively assessing progress of our students on an ongoing basis, knowing that, again, going back to old acronyms, for a very long time we've known in MCPS that our, our ever ESOL students, even who had long ago passed through successfully all of our ESOL programming, were underperforming their uh, their other classroom peers in in their academic work, even though the classroom teacher would tell you, you know, in the classroom they're they're on it, they're sharp, they're they're doing well, they understand the concepts, but then on the performance measures, they they just were always consistently underperforming. And then we look at our graduation data, and we know uh, this is a population that's very very at risk for not achieving graduation. But I, would, I, I, I just look at what, what I'm really wanting to see how we are regularly and routinely monitoring the, how these students are doing and being willing to acknowledge if what we're doing isn't working well. Because graduation rates, that's a blunt instrument. You can never get better than a D in any class and graduate. But I wouldn't say that's being successful academically. And so that's why I'm, I'm really interested in, in learning more as we go forward about how we are being accountable to this the to the students but also being accountable to ourselves and making sure that whatever initiatives and whatever approaches we're taking they're actually achieving the purposes for which we initiated them and if they're not we're willing to have that conversation that, that that's it yeah uh dr Jaftis, i saw your light on earlier do you still have a question uh, I, I do yeah i i thank you um and thank you to the educators uh really appreciate all the amazing work and the staff as well it's really very impressive um this is not just about the eml data but um on slide 20 the graduation data which i had seen earlier i think today um i'm just a little skeptical honestly about it and i'm not questioning your work or or integrity in the data whatsoever 
but we know that achievement is going down, right? We know that kids are really struggling, really struggled with the virtual piece and a lot of kids were very disconnected. So I don't know that I'm asking for an explanation right now, but I think I would like to dig a little deeper, um, Dr. McKnight, just to understand how, while achievement is going down, how students were experiencing a lot of um, disconnection from schools, that our achievement, that our graduation rates are, are going up. It just doesn't seem like it, it messes. And, and I want to be clear, I'm not questioning the integrity of the data, but I'm skeptical that that is really uh, valid, I guess. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaftis. Yes, we will bring back more specifics. I think there are a number of factors that we want to consider into this that um, that will just kind of bring out some uh, some adjustments, particularly as we look at this data over the last couple of years as a result of COVID-19. I think we may see some of that factored here as well as some other things that we can bring out. So uh, we can definitely follow up just to make sure you understand how some of those factors are considered into this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Ms. Sylvester. Yeah, I had um, I had thought that this would be a great topic for a committee meeting, maybe um, either special populations or strategic planning to really understand uh, the graduation interventions that Dr. McKnight mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. Ms. Rubin started before she changed roles. Um, I think there has been tremendous work yeah. in that area, <laughs> even before the pandemic. I remember Paint Branch, you know, gaining uh, several percentage points in their graduation rate. So I think that's a opportunity for us to dig deep in committee uh, to better understand that. Yes, I really like that suggestion, uh, Ms. Silvestri, because again, highlight there are many factors that, that we might want to spend time to dig into to see how this has played out in the data. So if it's okay as a follow-up, why don't we plan to follow up in a special populations committee where we can have a deeper discussion? Yeah, and again, just um, commend uh, the team. I mean, folks, Newcomers come with interrupted education. They have four years to learn the language, to learn the content, to learn the culture. Come on. <laughs> it's monumental, the work that our staff do with these young people and this, the effort that our young people put into being successful. They, they should have five years to graduate in my book, but no, the state says they have to have four, uh, and uh, our staff are doing tremendous work. I just want to emphasize, you know, yeah. this is monumental effort on behalf of the staff and the students, so thank you um, so much for that. I'd like to add to that. The outreach for, to these families, it's monumental. It is so overwhelming because they come to us with a lot of issues, a lot of needs. They need a lot of support because they're brand new to the language themselves as parents and guardians. And it's it's tough. It is not easy. And to Mr. Everts uh, neighbor, remember um, your board member here came to the United States in third grade without any English, without any documents, without any money. With access to opportunity, I am here um, today. So. Um, finally, um, I'm not, I always say I'm not exceptional. I'm just an example of what every mm -hmm. student can achieve when given access to right. opportunity. Um, finally, my colleagues might be wondering why we're having a newcomer presentation again uh, this school year. And I had asked the question of uh, accountability. So we have all these supports. We have all this uh, wonderful uh, staff working on this and so we had agreed to look at uh, grades and attendance data of our newcomers at today's meeting. I saw something in the memo that maybe I thought give you the opportunity to explain why we're not seeing attendance and grade data today at this meeting. Um, so for the attendance data, um, I will say that when we were looking at this, um, we can see um, in the data system, the, um, the over 10, 10 days or 10% absentee rates for the year. And um, we know that in the, you know, during the COVID surge, there was a lot of absenteeism. And what we 
would like to do is to work to look more at the month by month rather than the cumulative 10% rate to see if those rates have improved now. Um, but, um, you know, as I mentioned, we did, you know, look up and see that there is disproportionate absenteeism um, when we look at the, the chronic rate for 10% or more of the school year that it was disproportionately affecting our students who are emergent multilingual learners. Um, I, I don't have it, you know, disaggregated specifically for the newcomers per se. Um, but we're looking at ways we can kind of get at, get the data presented um, so we can look by month, by month by month and then work with the counselors so that we can um, sort of see by school. And in terms of the um, monitoring of academic progress. Um, one of the things that I, you know, kind of grappled with um, in looking, thinking about how we can present that um, specifically for students who are slife, we just see that so many students have been coming throughout the school year and have many different starting points um, and many of the ways that the interventions that they're interacting with they're interacting with um, at the classroom level, and it's not straightforward for us to really see, well, what is the growth overall for all these students when they have different, so many different amounts of time with it um, and different, um, different starting points. So, you know, we have looked at grades. I think I presented that at one of the county council presentations. Um, and, you know, at, at a future meeting, I can kind of bring more about um, the achievement data that we're, that we're seeing. We give Dr. McKnight the final comment on this. Okay. No, I just, I said we're, we're okay. I think um, whatever is Dr. Norton, I think we want to get to a point where we can say, all of this effort, all of this investment is working. And I don't know what the magic formula is. Is it grades? Is it attendance? Is it the ESOL assessments that you do? But we do need to come up with some system so that we can tell our public, tell our board members, um, yes, it's working. Yeah. Um, and thank you. To close out on that, Ms. Silvestri, we are working on that. We, we want to be very um, transparent and honest in what that is and coming out of disruption of COVID-19 for two years, we just have to take that into consideration to make sure what we're looking at is in fact our new normal. And it's not reflective of what's happened due to circumstances of many different changes that's happened. So that is something that we are committed to doing and we'll continue to work on. And we'll come back and share that with the board. Thank you. Um, I did want to end by thanking the team um, for coming and giving this presentation. I mean, every single one of you, we talk about returning to a focus on teaching and instruction as one of the visionary areas of our system. I mean, you were able to speak to how many slice coaches we have, how many students we have in every single program. You know their names. And this is reflective in all of the presentations that were shared today. I just want to say thank you because this is, it is about personalizing the work that we do at Central and knowing who is sitting in our schools behind that name and that face of students and staff that's doing this work. So I just wanted to say much appreciation for personalizing education for our students in that way. And I too wanted to thank Dr. Goddard for taking her time to come over today and share with us because it's always great when we hear directly from the principals that are on the ground with the students and the teachers. And it gives meaning to the work we hear about, but we're not actually doing. So to see the video and to hear you talk about it really sort of brings it home. We always appreciate that. So thank you very much for coming. Okay, we're up to item number seven, which is board policy. Everybody here already? Okay. I'm doing this. Okay. So welcome. I'm going to introduce this item on behalf of the Policy Management Committee because Ms. Mandrowski was unable to be with us today. 
Policy ABA community involvement focuses on an area that has truly been one of my priorities, and that is reaching the community. As you know, this has been an ongoing concern of everybody on the board, not just me, because there's so many people in our community that we do not hear from. So we are always, always looking for ways to improve communication. So we are committed to the development and promotion of inclusive, culturally responsive, and anti-racist engagement. And to that end, our goal is to create guidelines, structures, and practices to inform our decision-making processes. That is what this policy represents. So I want to thank the members of the Policy Management Committee and MCPS staff for the work that they put into the review and revision of this policy. The draft policy is before us today for tentative action. Uh, I will now turn it over to the staff to walk us through. I hope you can give a very sort of high level presentation of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, and good evening to uh, Dr. McKnight and other members of the board. Um, as you noted, we are asking you to approve this draft today for us to begin a formal public comment period. Um, but there's already been substantial and ongoing additional um, public facing work on this policy. So a discussion of the framework uh, took place before the Policy Management Committee on October 21st. We also reviewed two successive drafts by, by the committee on December 9th and February 22nd. And as our presenters will describe, there's also been significant community participation in the development of the draft that you see today. So joining us at the table are staff from the Office of Strategic Initiatives and Student and Family Support and Engagement. And I will turn it over to Mr. Landsman to introduce his team and their work to date. Good evening, Ms. Wolf, and good evening, Dr. McKnight, and the members of the board. My name is John Landsman. I am the executive director in the Office of Strategic Initiatives. I'm here with Edwin Hernandez and Francis Frost. And we have um, a team, the rest of our team includes Daniel Wilson Sadler and Terry Musi from the Student and Family uh, Support and Engagement, and Dina Cunet and Maria Hay from the Equity Initiatives Unit. We don't have a video with a really cute student in it. Um, but please think of Larry and his family as we go through our policy. We are excited to share our reimagined policy for community involvement, which we are suggesting to change to community engagement. To be honest, the past few months of working on this policy was an emotional journey for our team. As we work through the language, listened to the feedback from focus groups and our community partners, and wrestled with the conventions of how policies are written. Our own experiences of feeling unheard and unseen as employees, parents, and former students continued to come up. I made a point of introducing our whole team just a moment ago. Each of us has a very different lived experience that is influenced by our ages, gender identity, sexual orientation, and our cultural and racial backgrounds. This policy can never have been written without the experience and voice of each individual member. And that's the point of the policy that we're about to review with you. A large and diverse system like MCPS cannot effectively make decisions, write policy, and develop practices without the input and collaboration of all its diverse stakeholders. As you listen to our presentation and read the draft, you will recognize that this is not merely a modification of the current version. Our belief is that the original policy contributes to a lack of engagement. As we, as we reviewed the original policy and listened to the feedback, we developed two guiding principles. The first is that there is no such thing as a hard to reach family. Like everyone else, family, families make cal honest, calculated decisions about whether the engagement activity is a good use of their time and if they will come away feeling valued, heard, seen, and respected. The second principle is that effective community engagement requires intentional, anti-racist, and culturally responsive strategies. The truth is that we already have the tools and professional development in MCPS for effective community engagement. In fact, many staff members demonstrate this every single day, as you saw from our previous presentations. 
We believe that a clear, easy to use policy is vital to normalize this important work. Next slide. So as we began thinking about our policy, this is what we looked at. This is just a little snapshot of the diversity in our community. And we wanted to make sure that we we're reminded of that every time. Um, this is not who we often see when we're, when we're doing uh, engagement. And this is, this is the picture that we had as we began looking at our policy. Next slide, please. So the purpose of our policy, of this policy, of your policy, <laughs> is to ensure that we have intentional anti-racist and culturally responsive guidelines and structures for um, engagement and to affirm that we need the engagement of all our community members to meet our goals in MCPS. Edvin will now talk about the desired outcomes and feedback from our focus groups. Good evening, members of the board, Dr. McKnight. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and as I continue with this conversation, um, I had prepared a script, but I really want to talk to you from the heart. Um, as I think about this policy, I, there's an emotional connection that I have uh, to community engagement. And that is because I'm looking at my own experiences. When I came to this country, like Mr. Bestre, I was eight years old and also came to the third grade. And I was always, also an language, English language learner student. My mother would always say, um, ponte a estudiar si no quieres ser igual que yo, which means like, study if you don't want to be like me. But as I unpack that and, and think about that meaning, I mean, what did my mother saw, felt? Or what was wrong with my mother that she didn't want me to be like her? She was always a fierce advocate. Uh, she inspired me. And one of the things that I remember the most about my mother is when I graduated from high school, she couldn't stop crying. And for her, this was a, a great experience. When I was a parent, I had two kids in Montgomery County Public Schools that attended Richard Montgomery High School. And when I wanted my kids to be in the MYP program, um, and I would go to the school and I would ask questions, and sometimes I would be told that I needed to let my kids be more independent. But my own experiences from where I was coming, that engagement was so important. And so sometimes we have a system that we need to understand those things about our community because we're not all in the same place. And I wanted to share that story with you because I think it is important that if we want our system to be successful, we need to learn from our community. That is so important. And as I go on to my talking points, the, the, this policy that we have been revising creates the conditions and spells out in greater detail opportunities where we can be more proactive and intentional in engaging our community. I also want to let you know that we, um, in this policy, acknowledge that we cannot do this work alone. We cannot teach our students successfully if we're not getting not only the academic piece, but also the life experience as well. And we need that from the community. Our goal in this policy is not to engage the community for the sake of engagement. What we really want in this policy is that we understand that the achievement of all our students is important and can only be done if we are engaging the students, the families, and everyone in the community. That's what we want in this policy. Next slide, please. So when we, when, one more, sorry about that. So when we started doing this work back in October 2020, we set out to, um, meet with some focus groups. And we had uh, focus groups in five languages, English, Hispanic, Amharic, Chinese, and, and Vietnamese. And we also met with members of the Black, uh, Black and Brown Coalition. And in the dialogues that we had um, with these members of the community, we heard some themes. And we want to share these themes with you. Um, we um, heard that putting students at the center of this policy means engaging students in the decision-making process. We heard that 
Um, and like yesterday, uh, we had a, a meeting, a board meeting with students, and that's a perfect example of how we can engage students in our decision-making process in policies. This policy can also cannot be colorblind, and I would like to emphasize that. Without this specific language speaking to culturally responsive, anti-racist, equitable practices, if we're not specific intention on the language, some may give their own interpretation to this policy, and it can lead to downplaying the significance of race in engaging everyone in the community. We heard that from the members uh, that we engage. We also must recognize that the various cultures of the community and all background factors of diversity, um, this means acknowledging and understanding the dynamics and complexities of our diverse community. There's also a need to speak to our communities without the MCPS technical language. We need to have real conversations with each other. And to garner trust and create stronger relationships with the community, this is what we need. We need to be flexible to meet the changing needs of the community, such as the graph that Mr. Lanceman show, and make all our policies and regulations available to the community in various languages. Another important theme we heard in the community is that we just don't want to respond to MC MCPS. Families don't, ju don't just want to respond to the call. They also want to come to you, they also want to come to our staff, and they want to share with us their goals for their kids academic success. Community members also need to see and experience the real benefits for the time that they're putting in in the engagement. And finally, we need to be clear on how we want to engage the community. And this is something that we heard both from staff and the community, and that there's some confusion about the purpose of community engagement. So in this new policy, we offer recommendations how to make that more clear. I want to close this with a quote from a parent um, that was one in one of our focus groups. It was a mom that has two students in MCPS. And she said, and I quote, the communities have knowledge, ideas, opinions that could be used to improve the performance of students and the education system. I have professional training on public policies, and I consider what I can contribute from my own knowledge and as a mother of two students in MCPS, end of quote. I will now pass it on to Francis, who, who will now address the key concepts of this policy. Good, Good evening, Ms. Wolf, Dr. McKnight, and members of the board. As you've heard thus far, the committee members working with the Office of the General Counsel on this policy review bring various experiences, both professional and personal, in family and community engagement. Next slide, please. Oh, no, no, stay here, sorry. Um, you've also heard that we've engaged with stakeholders within this process. Edvin gave you a very good overview of that. Rising from this experience and talking with MCPS stakeholders, the proposed policy that you have before you raises these key concepts and to enhance and elevate community engagement in the district. The district is currently involved in an extensive anti-racist audit, equity work, and efforts to be more inclusive of all our stakeholders. This policy intentionally uses such language so that the purposes and goals of the district for inclusive community engagement are clear. In making board decisions, engagement initiatives will be designed for equitable involvement with culturally welcoming and responsive techniques to include our diverse populations, including our students. Stakeholders will be made aware of the purpose of community engagement and as defined in the International Association for Public Participation Continuum, their role in the decision-making process. These various roles and purposes are outlined on the handout that is in your information packet. Next slide, please. As board decisions vary, the need and purpose for community engagement will also vary. The methods of engagement should appropriately be different as well. We recognize that effective engagement is a learned technique there is an art to it, but there's also a science and appropriate methods relevant to the goals of engagement. MCPS will properly equip and train personnel to design and lead these engagement efforts to achieve the desired goals. In your information packet are a current guide to culturally relevant engagement and the evidence of equity as an example of resources to implement this policy. At the conclusion of engagement activities, a report will be provided to the board defining the purpose of engagement, the methods used, and those who participated. The board should find this data useful not only to ensure that diverse communities were involved, but for analysis on how to continually improve our processes and engagement. 
The policy is directed at the work of the board and board level decisions. However, that which is outlined here is also useful for implementation at the school level. So not leaving principals and school-based leaders to figure this out on their own, the tools and resources developed for the district should be shared with our school leaders so that we have effective and inclusive family engagement at each and one, every one of our schools. Our committee has discussed some of the finer implementing details of the regulations related to this policy, and we will explore additional guidance that may need to be addressed through a companion regulation, and as this policy works its way through public comments over the next month, we will continue to listen carefully to our stakeholders about further implementing guidance that may be necessary to support this document. So now I turn it back over to Ms. Percival Turner and Ms. Davis to walk through the proposed policy language. Next slide, please. And I will keep this brief if you would like me to. So I was going to hit more, but I'll cut it by about half. How's that? Um, I do want to take you to the first page, starting at line nine, to, to notice the, the change in the title, because involvement is only one aspect of the kind of community participation we want to achieve in this policy. Uh, next, line 15, the word commitment, because that was something that came through clearly in the focus groups that our, our feedback was they're looking for a commitment on the part of the board to inclusive, culturally responsive, and anti-racist engagement techniques. Um, let's move over to um, 28 and 29 on the next page, by whom, whom we mean by community, students, family, staff, community members. If we can jump over to 185, 189, I just wanted to point out some language about um, this is something we, we heard from the committee. The committee felt it was very important to include language about community-initiated engagement with the board. So you'll see starting at 185, the board encourages community-initiated engagement to inform its decision-making processes, and the board welcomes multiple and varied opportunities for the community to raise its aspirations, concerns, and analysis of issues facing MCPS. Um, and then finally, I'll just jump to the back to the desired outcomes, uh, beginning on line 379. So we re reworked this section to address the who benefits, and we saw this in several levels. Students will benefit from the diverse community's contribution of skills, knowledge, ideas, experiences, and time. Community stakeholders will benefit from being informed to understand the issues, opportunities, alternatives, and potential solutions that shape board decision making. And community stakeholders will have multiple and varied opportunities for their aspirations, concerns, and analysis to be heard. And with that, we are ready for your discussion and comments. Thank you. We'll take any questions or comments at this time, Ms. Aluni. Yes, I first want to thank um, the lovely people who have worked on this policy. Thank you so much for leading with empathy and vulnerability and passion. Um, I think you really showed what it's like to live this policy in practice through the rewriting of it. Um, I had originally asked Ms. O'Neill in July of last year to add this policy to the list um, that the Policy Management Committee was going to work on. It was like the first thing that I did days after my swearing in because of experiences like the ones that our students who testified today shared about feeling like seeking student voice in educational policy making was not institutionalized here at MCPS. So that was really how I wanted to approach this policy. And now looking over it, um, I do want to offer one amendment um, before we send it out for tentative action. On line 179, um, it reads that public engagement activities shall intentionally include students whenever appropriate and feasible. Um, I would like to amend that to say as much as possible. I just, I just, for a period after body, they will be engaged. <laughs> okay, Second. now. You're on the policy committee. Did this come up at the policy committee? I did mention it briefly to um, 
the committee as something that I would like to see reflected in, in future drafts, like the one that we, we knew it was going to come up today, um, but not specifically in that line. Am I able to offer that amendment now? If the rest of the board has no problem with it, I will accept it. I'm not seeing any objections, so right. it's fine with me. Um, at this time, I'd like to... Do we have to vote? I'm sorry. I move to amend uh, line 179 to strike whenever appropriate and feasible and replace it with as much as possible. Second. All in favor, raise your hand for that. Thank you. And at this time, I'll move that the, on behalf of the policy committee, that... Um, policy ABA be sent out for comment, public comment. And I want to thank you for your work on this. I, I had read it and it was really, really a great job. I mean, this is one of the most important functions of the board is to get input from the community. So I'm very pleased to see this. Ms. Sylvester, you wanted to say something? Ms. Harris was first. You know, I can't see her thing. That's what it is. I'm sorry. I can't see it. Ms. Harris, go ahead. Um, yeah, I want to echo Hannah's comments and thank you for that amendment. And um, I just really do want to thank you for this work because um, I think writ large what I hear is um, a statement that we understand the unique wisdom that our students and our communities bring and that that wisdom will add value to the work that we do. And particularly when we're talking about our students, if we, their lived experience in our school buildings every day is all, is the only way we know how we're, how well we're doing as a system. And this, I think, stands for that proposition that we need to know what they know if we're gonna do the best work we can and make the best decisions that we can. And I, I so appreciate that. And I'll just add, I, I hope the spirit of this policy infuses the work of every single school every single day um really and i do just have three questions on just um the logistics one this is important will we really do a big splashy press release to get the word out to community um so they know about this work and have the opportunity to really take a look at it and and know that their input is going to be valued um, and then um, the, when will the comment period open, assuming we do vote to put it out, when will that comment period open and close? Thank you, Ms. Saris. I can help you with that. We will certainly work with communications to get this messaged appropriately. Um, we will not have another board policy management committee this year. So this our intention, year. sorry? This school year. This school year, Yeah. sorry. So our intention is to leave it out over the remainder of the school year in the summer and bring it back to policy management in the fall. Um, we will, you know, following this meeting, begin preparing the website with the public comment materials, but it will take us a little time to get the draft translated um, and up with those other materials. But the English will go up pretty quickly and then the translations will come as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. And our, our expectation is that we would be returning to the policy management committee in, in, at an early fall meeting with an analysis of the comments and then coming back to the board in the fall for final action. Okay, thank you. And then I guess I, I'm not really even sure who to ask this question to, maybe Dr. McKnight. Um, accessing the public comment feature on our website is not easy and straightforward. I find myself that when I want to find those policies, I end up putting in the search window public comment. To, to pull up that feature. I, I mean, I think the spirit of this would be embraced if we had a big red button on the, <laughs> on the homepage of MCPS that says public comment, click, and then that will take them to the page where they can see all the policies that are open. But it's, it's too hard to find that, um, that feature. And it, I, mean, I mean, this means we want to know what you know and we want to understand what you think, and so I, I mean, I, to me, I, I'm not a tech person, but. No, absolutely, yeah. thank you for that. Um, very important example of the, how do we change systems to get the level of engagement that we want. 
as we go back out for public comment, um, as Sally mentioned, we will work with communications. That is a perfect example that we can take back and say, how can we make the accessibility of the technology available so that we can get as much input as possible, and especially since we have such a long length of time to do this. So I think that's one way. Um, I'll also offer that everyone doesn't go to a website. Um, and so we have to go beyond that and say it's, it, you know, you can provide public comment in this way, but what are the ways in which we engage with people that fit to their lifestyle, I, 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 to, to their busyness, all the priorities that they're managing? Going back to what our team just shared, um, one thing I think as we implement this policy, it gets at there's no one way to engage. Mm -hmm. And every time we engage, it should be multi-factored in terms of how we do that to get to all of these communities. So we will absolutely follow up. Um, I just want to say thank you to the board, and the team for bringing this forward. The timing of this policy is perfect because when we think about framing the work of an anti-racist system, this is the start of it. Mm -hmm. And with the policy directing that, um, it just marries up very, very much the opportunity for us to do it. And of course, there will be implications from this policy, from the audit, um, and work that we don't have to wait to do that right now speaks to what are the implications of our communications, processes and procedures, what are the implications for our schools? Because right now we're talking about community engagement from a perspective of when we're trying to get information, but we also think about engagement every time a parent walks into a school building. Whoever the first person is that they interact with, that's engagement. Yep. So what does that engagement look like that speaks to all of this? So I'm thrilled about the opportunity that this allows for us to be able to train and retrain and say evaluate all of our systems to really accomplish this policy in a positive way. So um, we will take that recommendation right now for public comment, um, and then we will go beyond that to make sure we take advantage of the time that we have to engage our families. Thank you. I, I hope that I'm not out of line um, with this, but I just want to share something that we heard also from the community, and that is exactly what you said, Ms. Harris, and that there should be a celebration about this policy. So thank you so much for your comment. Ms. Sylvester. Yeah, I would, echoing Dr. McKnight's comments, um, this is huge. Mm -hmm. This is culture shift, yeah. mm -hmm. and culture shift is hard. So let's not say, okay, done, check, let's get some comments and pass this. There needs to be a lot of work for this to be truly implemented at MCPS. Uh, so it becomes part of our culture. And, and frankly, training. Not, mm -hmm. people, want, people need help in how to do this effectively. Maybe they've, they, it worked well with this one community. Now they're, they're in a different school and it's a different community, different parent population. Um, and so uh, let's use the time to figure out how are we going to make this penetrate to every corner of MCPS, starting with ourselves as a board. Um, and I hope that we use the spirit of this policy to get the input that we want. Let's use what is in this policy to really test it, to see, okay, this is what we said we want to do, but how are our practices going to be true to the policy? So thank you. Is there an opportunity to receive oral comments on the policy for those people that are, you know, may not be agile or good at typing or just paraplegic, anything like that? Is there an oral ability? It's a really interesting idea. What I, what, what I can say that we do is as part of this development, and you'll see it in some of the policies that are coming to you shortly with the reporting out of public comments, um, we have used a multi-format approach where there have been focus groups with uh, small breakout sessions where our feedback has been collected that way in a discussive section with a translator. So that has been one way to do it. But I hear your point is not that. Yeah, because a lot of people can't make it to a focus group but still might want right. to call in. So I was just yeah, yeah. wondering, right. did you have a feature like that? And then maybe something... I don't know how you do it, but maybe we could talk to the tech people and figure out how to, to receive oral comment. But at this time, we have a, um, a motion on the floor. I don't need a second. And it's a motion to allow the revised policy to go out for public comment. All in favor, raise your hand. 
and that is unanimous. So I want to thank you again for all your work on this. And I'm so impressed that it's a, a diverse group that worked on it, so you really got some diverse perspective on the problems that, that, that are out there in communication. So thank you very much. At this time, we're going to have a recess, and we will return at 7.30. Thank you.
And we're up to item number nine, legislation. Ms. Webb. Good evening. We bring five bills for your consideration. This evening, the first bill is House Bill 0495, also known as Senate Bill 0519. And this is a bill that would um, bar uh, school systems from prohibiting students from organizing and participating in peaceful student organized demonstrations. 
our recommendation is that we, we support it with an amendment. And the amendment would um, ask that the provision be framed in such a way that it is clear that it is a family's choice that the student is participating, because as we've heard from school administrators, um, their concerns about um, requiring notice to them imply some kind of implicit approval, um, and so that the, the provision be framed around a, a family choice and that there be no requirement of notice or approval on the part of school administration. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. The second bill we bring before you this evening is House Bill 1268, and it's a, a, a bill about reporting requirements. It has a series of reporting re uh, requirements for st students arrest with reportable offenses. We recommend tonight that you support with an amendment, and the amendment would add the school safety coordinator into that reporting loop um, of the reportable offenses. So the school safety coordinator, um, who for us is Ed Clark, um, who, <laughs> so I'll make a person for you, um, who deals with the issues at the system level then would be in, in that reporting loop. So that's our recommended amendment. But Move approval. Second. Is there any discussion on this? Can I just make sure I understand? <clears throat> sure. If, if it wasn't in if we didn't add that amendment, we could still choose to do that, couldn't we? So, so it is who's re required to report the who's required to get a report of the offenses. So, because the school safety officer is ours, if we don't, if it's not in the bill, we can't require them to report those things to us. Oh, okay. Thank you. The next, the, wait the a minute, oh, wait a minute. Is there any further discussion? <laughs> Sorry. Do we need a vote on that, Sorry. don't we? We have a motion. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. The second bill is, uh, the third bill is House Bill uh, 1281, and that is a bill that would set uh, process and procedures for the recall of county school board members. Um, our position, our recommendation is that you should oppose it, that it, that like boards are elected locally, that any recall processes or provisions should be through a local referendum and they should be locally oriented. Move approval. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. The next bill is House Bill 1450, and that's the blueprint for Mar Maryland's future, and it's about moving timelines and giving a little more uh, time, given the, the late start on everything and allowing for carryover. So we are recommending support. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. And the last one we have tonight for you is Senate Bill 0773, which is public safety. And it's a requirement for dealers of firearms, how the kind of vault that they need to, and storage, they need to um, keep weapons in for dealers. Um, generally, we don't give recommendations on legislation like this, but given the concerns around gun violence, we, we are recommending that you support this bill. Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Okay. I go back and find my agenda. So, all right. At this time, we're up to item number 10. <coughs> Thank you, President Wolf. Um, for item number 10, we are bringing forward preliminary plans for Crown High School. Um, I welcome the Adams and our team to the table. Um, we will be sharing information and updates and presenting a resolution after the preliminary plans have been shared with the board. Turn over to you at this time, Mr. Adams. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, President Wolf, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present Crown High School. Uh, with me tonight, we have uh, Stantec Architects, uh, Dirk Jeffrey, and Jasmine McDuffie. 
And uh, we have with us also our, our school architect, Shio Shiavaski, who's going to walk us through some of the concepts here. So, so before we get into the slides, I just want to frame this project, because this is an extremely important project for us as a school district. Um, this project, as it stands right now, is intended to relieve capacity at five other high schools. Uh, so, so, you know, all right, so five high schools and, and thinking through how this project fits within the county, how we envision next steps as, as this building comes online. Um, we've had some really great conversations with our curriculum office. We've had some really great conversations with our, with our communities. Obviously, five high schools is, is, a, is a large um, area of, of engagement. Um, so, so we're very excited about this project. We're excited about it not only from what this, this building brings to us from a 21st century design, but also what it helps us think about with those other five schools and even schools beyond that. So um, we're very excited to talk through some of those nuances. We've had a really great experience through this. I would say that one of the, the, the neat things with this is we started this project during, during COVID. This is actually the first time I'm meeting some of our colleagues face to face tonight, which is awesome. Um, but it's an incredible team and, and uh, it's been an incredible experience to, to work through this one. So, so with that, if we can pull up the slides, um, I'll just frame a little bit about the project and then we can dive right in. Uh, next slide, please. So, so one thing I would just say about this one, um, right now as it stands, the, the board uh, has an approved schedule of, of 2026. Uh, I, I think it's very important to note that the non-recommended reductions also uh, show this project with a one-year delay out to 2027. Um, this project is, is, is unique because currently the city of Gaithersburg owns the property where this, where this building will ultimately be built. Uh, they've done a fantastic job of, of forward thinking this property and they dedicated this land uh, uh, back in 2006 with the caveat within 20 years the school system built a high school and if not it would go back to a different use. We are within that window but what I would say is that the thought process with where we are whether or not we stay on the approved schedule or if it's delayed we still want to start the project at the same time so that meaning we want to start the project in 2023 and that may just shift the expenditures out but nonetheless we would we would still be within that 20-year window with the city so so it's been also a great partnership again coming off kelly park with the city of gaithersburg and thinking through this property and, and next steps so diving right in, just from a site perspective, this is um, right next to the Crown Development. So if, if you've gone over there, um, one week goes by and they build more and more. So it's, it's continually evolving. Uh, but this property is on the edge of the development. And uh, it, it really actually allowed us a great opportunity to think about the site and where some of the amenities fit. Um, and, and think about how the building can be close to the community, the buildings themselves create that civic presence, um, but also sort of tuck away this, the stadium and some of those activity spaces a little bit further away from the community to, to avoid any of those challenges that we've heard or we continue to hear from, from some of the other projects. And even thinking about the stadium, just how it fits within the commercial properties around it. You know, how, just thinking through, is there ways to maybe take advantage of parking that's not on our site for, for future activities? So, the architectural team is going to go into a little bit more detail here. Did a fantastic job of showing a variety of different options, but you know, overall, the community definitely came out in support of of how this fits in, how it feels like it's part of the community, and there's no major roadways or buffers between the school and the community. So, uh, great design from a, from a site plan perspective. So, so with that, I'll stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to to Mr. Jeffrey to introduce his team and and dive right into the project. Man. Well, thank you, uh, Seth, and good evening, uh, President Wolf and Dr. McKnight and members of the board. It's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight to share with you the progress that's being made on the Crown High School. Uh, it seems appropriate to acknowledge that the work that we'll share with you tonight is truly the, the result of many people working together over many months on behalf of the larger MCS, MCPS community, and we're very grateful for all the voices, all the ideas that have contributed to the design that you'll see this evening. Our work began in earnest last uh, late last spring with the Facility Advisory Committee. These are representatives from MCPS with a deep understanding of how high schools are built and how they're operated, uh, the detailed requirements of your educational spec, the needs of your learners, and, and in particular, the vision for STEM learning that you, that's anticipated for the Crown High School. So we all learned a lot in a great deal, in a short period of time, and that process resulted in three very unique design concepts with different layouts of the building and the stadium, the parking, the play fields, 
that were then introduced to the community in the fall. And those three concepts were further refined through that process. And in December, a preferred uh, direction was selected. And this plan shows the location that the community preferred. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Before I do, I would like to take a moment just to introduce my colleagues who are here this evening. This is Jasmine McDuffie. Jasmine is a senior associate in our firm. She is a senior project architect on this project. And in that capacity, Jasmine leads the day-to-day -day work of the design team. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jasmine in just a moment. But before I do, I would also like to acknowledge two other members of our team who are in the audience this evening in the back row there. Wilfredo Rodriguez is our senior project designer. Wilfredo is actually a resident, lives very close to the Crown High School. He's hopeful that his daughters will one day attend the school. <laughs> <laughs> and then also keeping us honest all the time is Antu Nguyen, uh, assistant project designer, very talented team, and all of us working on your behalf. Um, next slide, please. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me just make a couple points about the site plan. So if you could go back, please. I'm sorry, thank you. So as, as Seth mentioned, this is uh, the site. Uh, downtown Crown is way off the screen to the left. The team uh, recognized early on that the Crown High School site truly uh, bookends, is the eastern bookend to the Crown community. And in that regard, uh, the principles of new urbanist planning that emphasize pedestrian experience and public place, uh, social connections, those kinds of principles were at were part of our discussions from the very beginning. And Jasmine will explain how those principles were integrated into design as we go a little bit further into the presentation this evening. Uh, you recognize the site, uh, the building location, as I say, as preferred by the community. There is a very strong pedestrian link from the north to the south of the site. That tan line is a linear, what we call the linear plaza. I should mention as well that from the north to the site, there is 40 feet of grade change that falls away, 40 feet. Uh, and despite that, the building, I'm sorry, the site is fully accessible uh, from north to south, fully accessible. And it also intersects with a crosswalk that goes from the west all the way to the east. Uh, and as, again, as Seth said, perhaps to connect to future use of parking lots. MCPS, I think, I think Montgomery College has an extension office over there as well. So perhaps uh, connections like that. And the other thing I would mention, and then I'll turn it over to Jasmine, is that this slide also recognizes that, and you can see that the, both the building, the long link wing of the building, and all of the athletic fields are positioned for optimal solar orientation. So daylighting and so forth, and all of the fields. And that sometimes can be very hard to do. So it's a very compact site, a very compact footprint, efficient, logical, connected in its planning. Uh, we're very excited about the design. I hope that you are as well. And so Jasmine, I'm going to turn it over to you. Next slide, please. So this is the what we're calling the lower level floor plan. And it's the first level of a five-story vertical school. And so when you're entering the campus on a, as a student on the bus, or if you're a faculty member, you're going to arrive at this level. If, you, if you're a community member, you may also arrive at this level because this is the floor that houses the gymnasium and a number of community um, events. And so the, the door, the main entrance from this floor level is in the middle of where the um, rectangular geometry of the orange um, athletic and physical education spaces meet that green dining space. And we're calling that central wedge between the two geometries of the building the heart of the school. And you'll see the heart of the school Trans, uh, transcend the height of this building. It becomes an important uh, feature for the building because it, it creates a sense of community for students. Um, it provides an easy way for wayfinding. Um, it, it's the location where we have our um, ver vertical means of circulation, both in terms of stairs and, and elevators for accessibility. So as you enter this level, you, on the, on the right-hand side, you're going to see the, the gymnasium. And you're going to enter into the heart of the school, which is um, you know, very open, inviting, and it provides that um, space um, for um, pre function space for events that are held in the gym. On the left hand side, you're going to see another open space, which is the dining facility shown in green. This is also very open and inviting and provides additional pre function space for events that meet, larger events that may be held in the gymnasium. As you work your way around in terms of the green, that, that dining space really 
turns the corner and creates, provides a connection for students all along this floor, and you, you result at an entrance off of Morrison that is, um, has a, what we're calling a learning stair, but it's like an indoor am amphitheater for students to gather, um, to have some informal learning opportunities, but also additional space for dining, and that connects you to some academic spaces. The area in blue is the school community-based special education program, and that's located on this floor because of the location for accessibility and it's off the bus loop. And the, the areas in green are our labs. She uh, and also for the spa interior spaces, uh, those spaces will be designed to, to be very flexible to accommodate any like variety of uh, different instructional programs and uh, for any like type of special programs like robotic or inter uh, artificial intelligence like that. So the framework of the space will be designed very flexible. Thank you. Next slide. And so when you get to this level, the main entrance at this level is in the same location off the heart of the school. And you'll see that on the upper part of the building, you'll see three doors. Um, I'd like to point out that this entrance also shares a plaza with the entrance to the auditorium. And so from a site perspective, it's going to be very easy for folks to find their way in terms of location for the Foreman Arts versus location to the main building. It's one entry plaza for both. Um, and, and you'll see to the um, left um, the, the play area for the child development system, um, program. But when you enter this building, you're entering into the heart of the school. And one thing that was important for us is that students all enter into the same location. Whether you're arriving at this level by car, or you're arriving by parent drop-off, or at the lower level for driving, arriving by bus, one central location, one heart of the school arrival for everyone. Um, and, and we're promoting or recommending some vertical connections between those floors to allow students to connect vertically with each other in the heart of the school. So as you enter, the area in red is the administration um, uh, main admin. Uh, offices, there's going to be a security lock, vestibule access control from there. And when you come in again, it's very open, very community driven. You're going to see the media center in yellow um, on your right. And you're going to have an opportunity that peach volume is the second story volume of the gymnasium. So it's going to be opportunities to add openings into the walls to see into that space, to connect with that space as well from this level. As you move around the, the, the floor plan and past the media center in yellow, you will be, have an opportunity to enter the performing arts wing, which is in purple. So in addition to having a public entrance off of the outdoor plaza, there's an internal entrance for students to, to arrive as well. The, we are t right now accommodating space for a wellness center that's shown in purple on the right san hand side of the plan. And that also has a dedicated entrance. What is this? That's the outdoor play area for the child development program. Mm -hmm. It's just little like this. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> Tiny writing. <laughs> and then I also want to add, uh, actually, in the back of the auditorium, there is a like space, open space. So we are installing the uh, retractable seating area there. So. It can be very flexible space, you know, when the seat is retracted, the space will be open for any type of instructional space. Next slide. So the first two floors are very public floors. They contain a lot of the public spaces that are going to be utilized from the community, the library, the gym, the performing arts space. And so as we, as we go up in the building, the next three floors are really primarily academic spaces for students. Um, this, is, this floor um, this is the second floor, um, immediately above the administration uh, floor. And it has the same footprint as the floor below. And so um, the spaces that are shown in the kind of teal and dark blue are, are academic, core academic spaces. And green are also core academic spaces. And we've located counseling in purple above admin. We've located the social emotional special, educa special education uh, program right across in blue. 
And because of the deeper footprint, we've introduced some courtyards to ensure that the, the key academic instructional spaces have access to daylight. Um, the central heart of the school is still there, and it has, um, takes on that still that sense of community and wayfinding. It still has the two, the two stairs and the elevator to allow students to traverse the building vertically. And as you'll see on every floor, when you're standing in that heart of the school, you'll start to you know, really envision students be able to also not only communicate internally, but also see out into the community through windows and, and vistas, um, on both east and west and also north and south. Oh, next slide, please. <coughs> this is the third floor, and the, flip, the footprint of that rectangle gets a little bit smaller. And so we have a, 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 a um, standard uh, double-loaded corridor with some, um, some um, open collaboration spaces in between to, to, to promote collaboration between students. Um, the areas in blue and green represent classroom and instructional spaces and labs. And so we are intermixing those throughout the building to promote interdisciplinary education. The areas um, in the middle off the open uh, heart of the school is another opportunity to create vertical connections with another learning stair or internal um, amphitheater type stair to connect this floor with the floor above, or floor below, excuse me. Uh, next slide. And this floor is almost a replica of the floor below. Um, it's, the top, it's the top floor of the building. And we've added a couple additional courtyards to, again, provide opportunities for those classrooms to have access to daylight. Next slide. As, as Dirk uh, mentioned earlier, um, one of the, some of the intrinsic nature of the building in terms of sustainability is the sole orientation of that long rectangular um, bar and how it's optimized for solo orientation. This building also has a very compact footprint, as Seth also mentioned. You know, we are, this project is, is um, retaining 65% of the site as being open. And so, you know, that's pretty impressive in terms of being able to d devote 65% of the site to green space, to players, to stadiums, to outdoor space. Um, and so some of those are, those are some of the intrinsic natures of what we've been able to do just with the planning. Um, some additional features that we are considering are introduction, introducing bioretention ponds for stormwater management. We are gonna um, look at uh, specifying plants that are native to the region for landscaping, um, specifying plumbing fixtures that are, um, have water conserving features, low flow, in addition to that, specifying energy efficient appliances and equipment. Um, we're going to be working with the CM to divert um, construction waste from landfills. Um, architecturally, we can look at opportunities to specify materials with high recycled content um, and that are materials that are sourced locally. And we are also looking at opportunities to introduce renewable energy sources to this project, such as solar panels, as well as geothermal and ground systems for the mechanical systems for the, for the project. And, and I would just comment just one, one piece on the sustainability slide. We had the opportunity to have the, the youth uh, town hall uh, on environmental sustainability Tuesday night, and it was fantastic. And, you know, the, the feedback that we received from students, we're really taking that to heart. You know, we're, we're going to look, obviously, to look to how to put solar and, and energy generation on the site to look at um, everything from vegetated roofs. But more importantly, we, we want to design this so the students can be a part of it. So thinking, again, how to connect that curriculum element to the building, um, is, is something that we're very excited to think through and, and come back to you all with with ideas and really have the curriculum office be able to share some of these really cool things that they're thinking through of how how we can again build build the building into uh, everyday lives of, of our students. So very excited about this piece. Thank you. Next slide, please. The next few next four images are of the exterior design. And I think for us, um, generally, the, the character is something where we're looking at using the window modulation and the, and the panelization of that to create some movement, some joy, uh, some energy in the facade. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first two floors are very public floors, which are very different than the academic course spaces that are above. And so in terms of the building's articulation of materials, we're looking at that base, those first public floors being articulated differently than the upper floors so that the what's happening on the inside is reflected on with what's happening on the outside. 
um, this particular perspective is taken as, you know, if you're on a drone, I guess, from the, from the stadium looking down, you see that entry plaza that connects the main entrance of the building to the main entrance of the performing arts. So again, very easy to make, find where you're at. Um, as Dirk mentioned, going from the, the north end of the site down to the south, there's a pedestrian plaza that connects all the way from Fields Road all the way down to the baseball and softball fields with accessible ramps and stairs um, to connect you. Um, and um, I guess next slide, please. This is a view taken from uh, Morrison. Uh, looking at the entrance from the bus loop. You're also looking at the edge along Morrison that faces the residential community. And so we're envisioning this as an opportunity to in introduce some of those um, stormwater management bioretention ponds with natural uh, greenery, create a lot of green space, open plaza space. We're looking at opportunities to set the building back a bit to provide some relief from the adjacent residential um, projects. There's an opportunity to introduce some outdoor dining facilities here because the lower level is where the dining um, portion is located for students. You can also start to see the articulation of the upper floors of the academic core a little clear here from the lower base. That lower base is a darker masonry. It's, it's, it sets a foundation. It creates that, that strong portion of the building, whereas the upper part is a lighter material. Um, and if you look at the corner um, part of the performing arts, we've dropped the elevation of that in terms of the massing to better relate to the residential um, uh, height of the residential townhouses across the street. Uh, next slide, please. This is the view you would see if you were entering off of Omega Drive from the bus loop or, or a member of the faculty or staff. And it's, it gives you that, again, that, that volume of that dark masonry, that base, followed by the upper of the, of the, um, uh, upper, uh, of the academic core. You can see the pedestrian plaza and the accessible ramps that are integrated with the stairs. We don't want to have a ramp over here and stairs over here. You really want to integrate um, accessibility into the site, um, one place for everybody to enter and to enter, 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 um, flow. And that part of that is also covered. Um, next slide, please. And this is a view looking at Fields Road in Morrison. And you can see at this point of view a little better that performing arts corner, really highlighting performing arts. A lot of times those choral rooms and music rooms are in the, kind of in the basement of the dungeon. We're really highlighting that in the corner and bringing some a lot of natural light into those spaces, a lot of joy for the students. Um, and again, this is probably easier for you to see how the height of that building is really stepped back and, and really comparable to the height of the residential houses that face this community off of, off of Morrison. And, and I think that concludes. I, I think we have a flyover. I'm not sure if we could pull the, the, the flyover up. And, uh, you know, as, as that's going around, um, you know, certainly just. Uh, you get the, the the screens here don't do the this justice uh, so the 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 renderings are very beautiful on uh on on the the pamphlet as well as some of the uh uh the other uh computer devices but um you know again this is that main entrance that uh that you heard about uh with the admin right there to the left and straight ahead being the the auditorium space so sort of having that wedge there so wayfinding is a uh, is a really important element of this particular site and uh, we talked about the wellness center. We're carving out a space for the wellness center right below that yes. overhang. Um, you know that is uh, that's not funded at the moment by by the Department of Human Health and Human Services, but we feel it's very important to include that space in in this design and preserve that as as a critical area. And then uh, obviously high schools. The uh, as, as I know, there's there's many principals here that that core athletic area, the gymnasium, heavily used. You can isolate that from the rest of the building, and, and, but it's very easily accessible uh, and, and, and really a, a well thought out, laid out, compact design. So it's one we're very proud of, and we, we hope you are too. So thank you very much, and Ms. Wolf, we'll, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. I had two questions, and you anticipated one, which was about the wellness center. I just didn't know what we do with it since, you know, it wasn't really funded yet. 
But my other question is more philosophical, so forgive me. When we met with the planning board, we decided we would try to be a little bit more collaborative so that um, we wouldn't have so much discussion towards the end. So have we shared any of this with them or, or attempted to address any of the concerns that they keep raising? So this particular project is not under the purview of the, uh, the, the planning board, but we are sharing this design. Um, this is this is an important one. Um, mm -hmm. This is in the city of Gaithersburg, which will go through their planning board. But um, much of what we've heard through those conversations is incorporated civic okay. presence, you know, location, minimizing uh, that impervious area. So okay. we're taking that to heart, um, and hopefully we'll use this as a good example, you know, moving forward as well. Thank you. Dr. Oh, yeah, I was going to refer to page 30 and 31 and 3M, but you captured it in the sustainability because I know that students are very interested in that and you've met with the students because they didn't seem to know that we were concerned about that with our buildings. So thank you very much for that. Are there any other questions or comments? Just wanted to... Um make sure that the the main entrance is that where the big parking lot was so the main the main entrance for the administration area is is on that the level up uh, from the gymnasium so yes it's it's sort of where the, the building sticks out a little bit I guess you want to call it that feature that sticks out um, off to the left with the auditorium to the right so it's it's sort of in that in that wedge uh, shape on the other side of right up right there right there um, so the admin area is, is directly forward so that, um, you know, as you park visitor parking, you would walk straight in sort of off to the left, you know, right by that, uh, that, that feature that sticks out from the building. Okay. And there's plenty of walkways so that safety is not a concern in terms of kids walking through the parking lot. Yes, that's correct. And one of the things that the, the architects have done a really good job of making other connection points from the community. So, you know, this would be for drop off, the backside would be for the buses. And then we have w really well thought out entrances on the community side for any walkers that are coming in uh, to, to not have to navigate any um, you know, vehicular uh, driveways. So, so, so the architects did do a good job of putting, you know, taking advantage of the grade, putting the buses on the lower level, the drop off, and, and some of the main parking up on that upper level. Did I hear you say this is five stories? Y yes. It shows as four on this presentation, but the, the lower level is not a basement, so it is that main academic is, is five stories. Just wondering from the perspective of principals and security, what challenges that or opportunities, I don't know. Yep. So that we're way. learning a lot through Seneca. The Seneca Valley is, yeah. is also, um, you know, a five-story building. So uh, you know, definitely get your exercise in a five-story building. But uh, we, we definitely are learning a lot about. Um, and we, we actually spend a lot of time thinking about and, and talking through security, um, you know, visual line of sight. Uh, a line of sight from inside outside the building so so that was a big part of this design and, and its orientation and configuration but but yes lots of lots of lessons learned from Seneca that we we are bringing forward to these uh, multi-story five-story designs at the moment and uh, my last question remind me um, I know this is still the design phase and we're delayed construction for two years so my question is when does the boundary study begin so that's that's a, that's a that's a good question one one that I think we, we definitely would want to get started earlier on than, than later um, typically we wait until towards the end to, to let the enrollment start to really have a good idea of enrollment however you know with this school coming online in 20, 2026 or 2027 depending on if there's a delay uh, Woodward and new Northwood opening up that will involve you know boundaries of the DCC and WJ and also, um, you know, Damascus High School, which we haven't talked about, is going to come online right in this window, which is also being built for a boundary with Clarksburg and, and Damascus. So, so, so we have the potential to have a very large um, boundary process that I think is going to be very different than what we're used to in the past. So, so one that, you know, Dr. McKnight has, has spent quite a bit of time talking about, one that we're, we're definitely still thinking about. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Harris? Yeah, I just, one question, um, and I apologize if I missed it, but what are we envisioning the capacity? 
Sure. So, so the capacity right now is is a little over 2,200, mm -hmm. um, and that's the sweet spot from a state funding perspective. So, if you look at the the you know the the projects that are, um, this is serving from a capacity standpoint. That's what that adds up to. Um, the one one of the five in that is is Wooten High School. Yeah. So that's also a school that we're talking about and rebuilding. So, you know, that will be part of the capacity. But one other thing that you saw, maybe you saw or you didn't see in this, is that the, the architects have done a good job of master planning additional build out to possibly 2,700. So over the next couple of years, we'll keep an eye on this. If, if we see growth happening more rapidly than what we're projecting, we have the ability to add here. We have the ability to look at, at a Wooten. We have, we have a variety of different options that we could pursue. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. So at this time, can I get a motion to um, accept the presentation? So moved. The presentation. Second. Are there any other questions? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we're up to item number 11. Thank you, President Wolf. Um, we're going to bring forward approval for the members of the new district committee on assessments. The committee is appointed biennially as um, a part of the More Learning, Less Testing Act of 2017. This committee is um, going, Ms. Hazel is actually joining us at the table to talk more specifically um, about the purpose of the district committee on assessments and also the work of the previous committee that then uh, folds directly into an overview of what the membership looks like and the timeline of what they will complete, of what has been completed over the 21-22 school year, and then moving forward. So, Ms. Hazel, I'll turn it over to you at this point. Okay, thank you. Good evening, uh, President Wolf, members of the board, Dr. McKnight. Uh, very briefly, the 2017 uh, Maryland General Assembly passed the More Learning, Less Testing Act of 2017, which limited the amount of time that we could devote to local mandated assessments to 2.2% of our instructional time, with the exception of grade eight, which is 2.3% because of a state mandated assessment. The legislation requires that school districts ensure that all of the assessments are clear in their purpose time limited, worth taking, high quality, and tied to student learning. The legislation also requires that we form an assessment committee to review all of our mandated assessments and make recommendations to the following areas. The time required to administer each assessment, so we have to agree on that time. The duplicativeness of assessments. The purpose of assessments the value of feedback provided to educators, and the timeline of results. And the More Learning, Less Testing Act um, asks that we have a committee that represents administrators, parents, teachers, uh, community members, and students. So um, the list that you have in your memo is the proposed list of community members that we would like to have um, meet for this committee this school year. So prior to the pandemic, we did have an assessment committee that met, and we did make recommendations to the board, and they were shared uh, with the board on May 30th of 2019. Uh, there were a variety of recommendations in terms of the assessment windows, um, ensuring that we're not over-testing our English learners, um, wanting to make sure that we have enough time for some of those external assessments. So there were a variety of recommendations that we put forward. So this um, act does require that we make recommendations every odd year. Obviously, this is not an odd year. But because of the pandemic, we did make the decision not to meet. And we are meeting this year um, to review the past recommendations and ensure that we are moving in the right direction, that we are not over-assessing, that the assessments are meaningful to our students and to the teachers who use that to inform their instruction. So we have already met once. Um, we have three additional meetings that we want to have to make sure that we are headed in the right direction and that everything is aligned. Um, and then we will meet again next school year just to make sure that we are on track with the odd number requirement. So at this time, I will stop, Ms. Wolf, to see if there are any questions. Yeah, I just have one question. Um, 
I noticed that this is a pretty detailed list and you have a number of uh, staff from elementary, middle and high school, but I don't see an actual teacher. So I was wondering about the possibility of adding a teacher. Oh, we have several teachers. Classroom no, teachers. classroom teachers from yes. elementary. Which uh -huh. ones are the classroom ones? We will make sure um, that we have an updated list, if not, because we have a number of teachers um, from all levels on the committee, as well as students. So I don't know if, we'll, I'm, I'll make sure that that list is OK, I'd just like to be sure to get a list of, sure. of that. To, to be sure that someone is included from every list, yes. from every level, that's an actual classroom teacher. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So what do you need from us at this time? I think um, also, um, President, well, sorry to interrupt, but I think also we had talked about maybe adding a student or two. Yes, oh, that's on there as well. Oh, so we'll, okay. An well, additional yes, student. Mm -hmm. Yes, a couple. Mm -hmm. Well, I will give you an updated okay. list okay. of Okay, okay, And Ms. Hazel, I just want to make a uh, request for, I know you have Dr. Norton, but an ESOL teacher's perspective I think is really important. You know, I we have concerns about the over-testing of ESOL mm -hmm. students and I yes. think their voice needs to be well represented. Absolutely. We, we will do that. Ms. Harris? Yeah, I, I just have a, I guess, process question. Um, is, is the vision that, and the requirement that this is a committee that will be formed for one time meet this certain set number of times, make their recommendations and then dissolve? Or is this something that will be sort of a standing group that will be periodically reviewing? We did um, reach out to the former uh, committee to see if they were still interested. There were about half that are, that are still a part of the original group. And then we added additional individuals to that group. And we'll probably do the same for next school year. Um, but we will just review it for the four, hopefully, four meetings. If we need to have more, we will do that for the four meetings. And then we'll pick right back up next school year so that we can be on, on track with our, our timeline. So we'll use the same committee members. And we'll add some more as people kind of rotate out. So this is a committee that has is going to be sort of standing, basically, with members rotating? Members rotating out, yes. Yeah. So community members said, not interested. I'm doing some other work with other committees, but I'd like to recommend other individuals or teachers have moved on to other types of positions. And yep. so we were able to fill those. OK, all right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? OK, I'm not seeing any, so. I need a motion to approve this. Move to approve. Second. Are there any other questions? Ms. Okay. So we're approving a committee that you said is already changed. So is that an issue? Yeah, well, we she's, she's going to provide I've, it to us. I have an updated list of, with the teachers on it. OK. Yeah. All right. And we'll get that before your next meeting. Absolutely. All right, thank you. You'll have that tomorrow. Are there any further questions? All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we're up to consent items. Is there any item that anybody wishes to pull? Okay. Can I get a motion to move items 12.1 through 12.7 in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Can I get a motion to move items 13.1 and point two in block? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That's unanimous. Is there any new business? Seeing none, item 14 is for information only. And I believe we're up to adjournment. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. And we're early. Yeah.